General topic of aliens, I think the way most people frame it as, we officially know nothing, we have no information, and therefore serious work just can't be done. I think that's false about both of these topics, both UAPs and aliens. So in our grabby aliens work, we're claiming that we know quite a bit about the distribution of aliens in space-time. And you might say, but we've never seen one, so how could we know anything? And the point is, we do see other data that's relevant, and we can put that together cleverly to learn a lot about aliens. There are these historical examples where it switched over. Some sort of evidence was enough to make people take it out of the superstition crazy realm. So what, is, what would it take to do that with UAPs? Basically, they're saying, this is so crazy and likely. If we say, why? Because cosmologists have told us so. And I say, no, they haven't. That's where I'm trying to go is say, look, from what we know about cosmology, this is not crazy unlikely. It might be unlikely, but it's not crazy unlikely. That's the key difference. Can we get people to, to accept it's not crazy unlikely? The Coyus Institute is a pioneer in the field of AI-driven comparative and qualitative analysis and was established with the primary goal of uncovering the hidden value left behind in complex data sets. Through a combination of human expertise and cutting-edge technologies, Coyus has developed a range of services that cater to various industries. They are providing valuable insights that can help drive growth, formulate competitive strategy, and to identify key patterns in targeted demographics. Head to their site to learn more, coyos.institute. That's C-O-E-U-S dot institute. So, you know, what originally kind of brought you to my attention, it was the Grabby Aliens paper that you did. That was my first exposure to you yeah. uh, on Lex Friedman. Uh, and, of course, it was an incredibly uh, fascinating paper to me because it really, you know, provided a lot of links uh, an opportunity to explore the conversation further. So I loved how you were able to integrate UAP into the model itself uh, to kind of work through some assumptions. I'll let you speak to that. But um, why do you think that we don't see more academics engaging in this type of work? Because it seems like there's a lot to really uh, unfold there. I'm not the first person to notice there's a taboo here, hmm. <laughs> right? And it's pretty strong. And it's remarkably strong and even puzzlingly strong. <laughs> It's worth wondering exactly why, but it's pretty clear. So I started out in physics a long time ago, and physicists are just really strongly of the opinion that there's like a certain kind of pseudoscience that they should just dump all over. And then this has been classified in that category of pseudoscience. Hmm. And elites, especially in our world, you know, they're, they're eager to show that they're different from ordinary people and they sort of share the opinions of elites and not the opinions of foolish ordinary people, and this is one of those things on the list. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so what, have you received any any kickback? And I know you haven't just jumped onto the scene. You've been writing papers about this to some degree since the 90s. Is that correct? About aliens, yeah. Correct, yeah. Although there's much less about the taboo about aliens than about UAPs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about that difference. So uh, UAP, from my perspective, now the, the terminology is unidentified anomalous phenomenon. So right. we're classifying that as uh, a domain agnostic uh, observation that doesn't fit our expectations, to right. be loose. Um, and we're, we're now starting to track that and gather numbers about that so we can, we can learn more about that. Um, so it's a, it's a practical issue that we're seeing. Um, but then we separate that and we say, let's look out into the universe as if we're separate from it. Uh, and we say, do we see anything out there? Um, I presumably within our light cone, uh, but um, we don't. And that's, that's part of the, uh, the confusion I think that people have in this because we're potentially there's the opportunity for something to be in our backyard that we don't see anywhere else in the universe. Can you maybe perhaps describe how you've integrated those two categories of anomalous uh, activities here, aliens as in the wider universe, and what perhaps is in our sky that we can't identify? I realize that's a super right. big question, too. <laughs> so the general topic of aliens, I think the way most people frame it as, we officially know nothing, so if you're going to talk about it, we're just going fun speculation. Mm -hmm. And in fun speculation, you can make a movie, and you can, you know, you can play with it, and that's okay, as long as you're in fun speculation mode. But the official story is we know nothing, we have no information, and therefore serious work just can't be done. Um, I think that's 
false, in essence, about both of these topics, uh, both UAPs and aliens. So in our grabby aliens work, we're claiming that we know quite a bit about the distribution of aliens in space-time. And you might say, but we've never seen one, so how could we know anything? And the point is, well, we do see other data that's relevant, and we can put that together cleverly to learn a lot about aliens. Now you would think, what? So I like the analogy of long ago in ancient Greece, they managed to figure out how far away the sun was. <laughs> and you might think, how could you possibly look up into the sky and figure out how far away the sun is? Mm -hmm. They had this clever thing about the shadow length at one latitude versus another latitude on you know, the peak Day, you know, noon on those days, and can use that, seeing the distance to these two places to figure out how far away the sun was. Mm -hmm. And I'd say similarly, we actually have some data that we can use to figure out the distribution of some kinds of aliens in space-time. You just have to be clever about it. So we have a three-parameter model, and each of those parameters is fit to concrete data we have. And so the story is, then we know this model, roughly, it's a stochastic model of where aliens are in space-time. And we say we kind of have to believe it because of another key datum, which is that we are early in the history of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the date on the clock is a key piece of data. And it tells you there are aliens out there right now. <laughs> and using these other pieces of data, we can get the distribution in space time. So I, I know you, when you're hearing this, you're going, that can't be right. But it's being as clever as those ancient Greeks did to figure out how far away the sun is from just... <laughs> you know, a few pieces of info you couldn't figure, and we can do the same thing with aliens. So the three pieces of data we have are the date on the clock, that it's now 14 billion years since the beginning of the universe. There's the piece of data that at the moment we don't see anything in the sky, that's data. And the third piece of data is when we look at the history of life on Earth, we can see certain key events happened at certain dates, and that gives us a key clue to basically how many hard steps life had to go through to get to where we are. And that's another key parameter. So with those three parameters, each one of them tells us about one of the three parameters in this three-parameter model, and that tells us where aliens are in space-time. Wow, that is very clever. Well, let's talk about some of the assumptions in there. One of the assumptions, uh, I believe, is that um, some of those hard steps may have had to occur off of Earth. Is that correct, using a panspermia concept? So in our simple grabby aliens model, we make the simplest assumption that life on Earth started on Earth and had no ancestors before that. Okay. And in that simplest model, um, we are an independent origin from aliens. And basically, advanced life like us would appear roughly once per million galaxies. <laughs> and then it would spread out at near half the speed of light, roughly, and then we might meet it in roughly a billion years if we were to expand mm -hmm. to be like that. So it's really rare. Got it. Under that simplest model, there's no way <laughs> there's any aliens near here. The, the chance that anyone would have originated that close is crazy low because they appear once per million galaxies. Mm -hmm. So the, the simplest model just doesn't let aliens be anywhere near. Got it. But we can modify that model in a plausible way to make a correlation. <laughs> so. Aliens could be siblings. That is, we could have had a common origin, uh, a previous planet before Earth, uh, that there was plenty of time for that. So we are now at 14 billion years. Our planet started about four and a half billion years ago. That leaves nine and a half billion years at the beginning of the universe for s other stuff to happen. Mm -hmm. The peak of when stars were forming was about four billion years after the origin. So if a star had formed then and a planet around it, it would have had, you know, another six billion years <laughs> when life could have been evolving on it. And then life from that original Eden could have moved via a rock that smashed, you know, some rock smashed into the planet, mm -hmm. knocks off a rock that has life on it, it drifts, and it could have seeded the stellar nursery where Earth was formed. So stars are formed in nurseries with roughly a thousand stars all formed together in the same place and time really close to each other with lots of rocks flying back and forth. Mm -hmm. And when we say this life, we're talking about microbial life. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. something very simple. Uh, but life could have started... But the most complex, perhaps, at, at the, this point in history in this local group. Right, so 
life had to go from really simple at the beginning mm -hmm. all the way to really complicated where we are. Mm -hmm. And the, plausibly, that was just really hard. There were a lot of hard things that had to happen to make that happen. So in order for that to happen in the last 4 billion years of our life on Earth, life on Earth had to get really lucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a bunch of things that were really hard happened to happen especially fast. And so an analogy is cancer in the human body. So basically in your body, there are trillions of cells. And in order for you to get cancer, one of those cells has to have six mutations. And it's really unlikely for any one cell to even have one mutation. Mm -hmm. And so it's especially unlikely for a cell to have six mutations. But by the end of your life, you have a 40% chance of having cancer somewhere in your body. So one of those cells had all six mutations. It got really lucky, that one cell, in the sense of all those things happening in that one cell. So the an analogy is with Earth is there's all these planets, and maybe many of them start out at the beginning of this life path, but it's really hard to go down each step, and most of them never get past the first step, or never even get to the first step. But some lucky planets go through all of these mutations, <laughs> and finally get to a place where we are before the deadline where that planet no longer supports life. Mm. And the idea is Earth was really lucky, <laughs> and that's why we're so rare. But if there was a longer period of time <laughs> when life started on some Eden, then it would have had a lot more time to go through all those steps and m makes that whole process a lot more likely. And so uh, life could have gone halfway down the path and then you know, to a much more complicated than the very basic life, and then some rock knocked it off, and then it seeded our stellar nursery with some intermediate complexity life, and then that continued to evolve for the last four billion years to get to where we are. And seeding that stellar nursery would have seeded basically all of those stars mm -hmm. with life at that level of complexity. And then you know, all those stars drifted apart quickly, and they formed a ring around the galaxy, and we can actually see them out there because they have exactly the same chemical composition as our star our star, because it came from the same nurseries, we can actually identify many mm -hmm. of them out there. And the idea is one of those other stars had a planet which life evolved like on Earth, but it got to our level first. Mm -hmm. And they had an advanced civilization there, and then they came here. And that's how there could be aliens here, but not anywhere else for the next million galaxies. <laughs> Right. right. There's a local cluster of life that popped up. Right. Exactly. Time. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, those that stellar nursery. This is how you calculate um, your priors for this, correct? And would you mind defining that? How you kind of calculate sure. a probability based off of what you just said? So, the key idea for UAPs would be, what the hell? <laughs> what are these things? <laughs> we have four major categories of theories. You know, they could be just mistakes and hallucinations. They could be lies and hoaxes. They could be some hidden Earth organization with amazing powers, or it could be some alien organization with amazing powers. So in order to guess the relative chances of those hypotheses, we need to have two things for each hypothesis. One is a, what's called a likelihood, the chance that the evidence we see would happen if that were the truth. And another thing we need is a prior. What's the chance that that sort of thing would happen, <laughs> ignoring the evidence? Mm -hmm. And if we can multiply those two things together, normalize over these four options, and then that's what we, how we get our posterior, i.e. the chance that each hypothesis is true. So because I did this grabby aliens work, I decided I'm kind of an expert on the prior for aliens hypothesis. I got to say, you know, what's the a priori chance that this would be true? And in order to do that, what I need to do is come up with the most plausible hypothesis that could be consistent with what we know about the UFO phenomena and the rest of the universe, and then for each component of the hypothesis, penalize it for how specific, unusual an assumption I'm making in order to make the story work. So I've come up with what I think is the best story I can for if UFOs were aliens, how that could make any sense. And it's got several components. And when I put those components together, I come up with a prior of, say, roughly one in a thousand, one in 10 or 100,000 in that range. Mm -hmm. And the important point is that's high enough that you really got to look at the evidence. That's the key point. So in a murder trial, you're asked to believe that A murdered B, okay? 
the prior probability on that is basically one in a million. That is, only one in a thousand people get killed, and they probably have a thousand people nearby who might have done it. Mm -hmm. And so to, to believe that A kill B, you're being asked to overcome a prior of one in a million, but often you can do that. Concrete evidence in a murder trial will convince you that, yeah, A killed B. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you don't dismiss a murder accusation. You don't just say, murder's crazy, unlikely, that couldn't have happened, and just throw it, you know, ignore it, right? And so, but many people for the UFOs as aliens hypothesis, they basically say, that's so crazy. I, I don't even have to look at this evidence. That's so unlikely that it's just no so need to look at it. Let's not even quantify it. Right. Uh, now, there are some kinds of hypotheses you might think are so unlikely that you're just not even gonna consider them. Mm -hmm. But I'd say in this case, isn't one of them. <laughs> Uh, this is the sort of thing you'll have to look at the evidence for. That that would be the main point. But that's my contribution to this whole issue is to say, first of all, the prior likelihood is high enough that you got to look at the evidence. You can't just dismiss it on the basis of that seems crazy unlikely. Mm -hmm. And then furthermore, well, what specifically is the most likely hypothesis that could make sense of this? Because that's the sort of thing you should kind of believe if you end up believing that UAPs are aliens. Mm -hmm. Well, before we talk about some of that evidence, let me just ask you... Uh, with what you just said about stellar nurseries and our ability to detect them and uh, identify them, one, is there a way to perhaps use that uh, proactively, that information, that knowledge to um, further refine um, that calculation? Uh, and two, would that perhaps be useful, That what you just stated, that observation, would that be useful and perhaps for SETI or um, for a James Webb Telescope as a uh, target list of potential uh, solar systems for further observation. Perhaps there are microorganisms right. that are producing gas in these atmosphere. James Webb might be able to detect them. Do you think that might be a legitimate um, um, path to pursue for uh, more proactive observations of life? Uh, if panspermia siblings hypothesis is true, then in fact, there's these thousand other stars out there where planets around them plausibly will actually be hosting life at the moment. So they are a good candidate for looking through telescopes to see if life is at those planets. And you know, standard signature is to look in their atmosphere and see, say, do they have a lot of free oxygen? Because that's a signature in our atmosphere that there's life here. Uh, the problem is at the moment, say our best telescopes can see some kinds of you know, gases and atmospheres relatively close, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe you know, a 10 or 100 light years away, but these thousand planets are basically you know, five or 10,000 light years away. Are they? Because they're, they're, they're up because, to 10,000? Because they're, they're, they're spread in a circle around the center of the galaxy. Oh, that's right. right? Yeah, because they've been taking 4 billion years mm. to spread out. That's interesting. So, yeah, they're basically a ring around the galaxy. Right. And so some of that ring is close. Mm -hmm. And so there's probably something that's the closest one, and we should try to look at that. Um, but, you know, that wouldn't be, you know, clear evidence because maybe only a third or, you know, a tenth of them have been seeded with life or something. So, and maybe a particular star wouldn't happen to have planets in the right place or whatever, the right type. But still, yeah, it would be a way to check. Interesting. And you're not claiming that that ring uh, wouldn't be the only hospitable place in our galaxy, but only hospitable for uh, potentially life that would be immediately recognizable as congruent to well, us. Well, it's just the place that it would be if we had a common origin. Got it. Right. In the stellar nursery, right? So any place out there maybe could have life, but again, we've got this like w really low chance that any one thing gets very far, but the stellar siblings might have gotten a lot farther because they have this, because we know that we gone a long way, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that means our siblings have a much higher chance of having gone further than a random place. Have you spoke with any uh, astronomers or others that work, you know, directly in this field that on this theory? Uh, no, but I, I would... It's going to be a while before we get this sort of confirmation, but mm -hmm. yeah. But I think many people already kind of know yeah. that this is one of the more interesting places to look is in our stellar siblings. Very cool. All yeah. right. Well, let's talk a little bit about that evidence, perhaps. My assumption, maybe it's not correct, is that there's been renewed interest from you or involvement in this recently, or has there been a pretty consistent drumbeat on this for you? So among a lot of people, the idea of aliens is interesting and just the overall history of life on earth is interesting and I tapped into that subject you know 25 years ago <laughs> uh, when I wrote about what I called the great filter and 
many people thought that, that was an interesting topic, but it wasn't something anybody thought you could get a job with or get funding. And so only a few people like me who would, on the side, play with it, you know, played with that. But over time, other people have came to use this phrase, the great filter, to describe the basic puzzle of why the universe seems so empty. Um, and again, I wrote about that 25 years ago, and then I set that aside as well because I was trying to, you know, get a career going and get tenure in economics, which I did. And, you know, my colleague said, you shouldn't, you know, this is a distraction from your, you know, career in getting economics, and I, I took that to heart. Uh, but then a few years ago, I came back to the topic because I read a paper that was talking about very long-lived stars, most stars are much longer than ours, and about how this hard steps model that I talked about, that life has to go through many hard steps, uh, has an interesting implication that life would be much more likely to show up on these long-lived stars than our short-lived star. And that clued me into the fact that people in this area had been neglecting this hard steps model when thinking about aliens. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I came back to this topic three years ago, because I had the sense they were missing that, which they were. <laughs> and so often, you know, the, the key to making progress is to like keep in your mind a list of interesting topics and then wait till you have an angle on one. You say, like, oh, I've got an angle on this one that other people don't have, and let's pursue that angle and, and go with it. So that was my angle, which was this hard steps model people have neglected. So the key, the key interesting point is if life has to go through a number of hard steps before it can get to our point, then the longer the duration of a planet <laughs> to go through all those hard steps, the more likely it is to succeed and not just proportionally, but to a power. Mm -hmm. So if there were six hard steps that life had to go through, which is a roughly best estimate for life to get to our level at, at this point, then the chance of advanced life appearing would go to the time duration of the planet to the power of six, wow. which is the same in your body. That is, cancer in your body needs to go through roughly six, six steps in order to get the mutation. And the chance of your getting cancer as a function of time is roughly the power of six. <laughs> Of, of your lifetime. That is, you're almost certainly to get it near the end of your life, you know, not in the middle or sure. the beginning. Uh, so the key point now I hear is that long-lived stars should be much more likely to have advanced life than short-lived stars, and we are on a short-lived star. Mm. So our planet will run out of room for life in another billion years, and therefore there's only right a five billion year window on Earth for us to appear, but the average star lasts for five trillion years, a thousand times longer. And so if the chance of life showing up on that should be a thousand times more raised to the power of six or 10 to the 18, mm. which makes us crazy early, unlikely. That is, why would life show up on Earth, which is a short-lived star with a short-lived planet, as opposed to on one of these much longer-lived stars and much later in the history of the universe. So, Are we talking about red dwarfs? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would that be a place, so if, we're, if we consider our, our st stellar nursery and the output from that as our you know, cousins, if you will, would looking at life around red, red uh, dwarfs be more applicable to looking at perhaps older, more and more mature civilizations? Well, if, if we were later in the history of the universe, that's where we'd look. But okay. we're, we're oh, yeah. now early. Okay, that's right. right. So it's still too so early. So there are all these, even the red dwarf stars, they have only been around for a few billion years, mm -hmm. right? They haven't been around for trillions of years because the universe isn't that old. So the, the puzzle here is that we, we do a calculation that says if the universe would sit and wait empty for advanced life to show up, then it should show up much later than now. And the answer to this puzzle is the universe would not sit and wait empty. <laughs> Right now, the universe is filling up. Aliens are right now out there f taking the universe, reshaping it, making it the way they want, and they're expanding. And in roughly a billion years or so, it'll all be taken. And there won't be any place for life like us to appear. Mm -hmm. We had to appear before that deadline. And that's the answer to why we're so early. All advanced life has to appear before the deadline of when the universe gets filled up. And that's the reason why we are early, and that's why the reason why the, the date on the clock is telling you they're out there. But then to fill out this model, we need to make a full statistical model of the distribution of aliens in space-time. And so that's what we've done with the three-parameter model, fit to three pieces of data that tells us roughly where they are and when we'll meet them. Very cool. 
And I know you actually were able to calculate a date. Uh, it's nothing on our calendar, but what we show is there's a probability distribution over the date, mm -hmm. and you know there's a small chance it could be much earlier, Sorry. but the middle of the distribution is roughly a billion years. Mm -hmm. it depends on some parameters, so like it's a very rough estimate, but it's not soon. <laughs> By chance, that would be a, a chance uh, right, so meeting. There's, there's a bunch of random variables in here. Mm -hmm. Like, there's how early are we in the distribution of alien civilization? We could be very early. We could be very late. There's just, they appear once per million galaxies, but at random. Mm -hmm. Did one happen to appear much closer to us or much farther away? Those random elements means we can't set the exact date because we, we're not sure, you know, you know, how early we are, how close the nearest one is. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is if, if we then look at the model and say, okay, UAP do represent something from somewhere else, uh, that much lower probability, you know, becomes a certainty. And how does that incorporate into that model? Right. So the simple grabby aliens model, as I said before, just doesn't find it at all plausible there could be any aliens near us, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It says, no, that's, that's just kind of crazy. Um, so, but where there's a simple way to modify it, which is to assume that the aliens are siblings, panspermia siblings to us, that they evolved from the same original planet that we did, where life spread from that planet to our cellar nursery, and then we drifted apart, but we had the same origin. And that would be a way to allow aliens being here. What are they doing? Well, so we have to add something more to this story to mm -hmm. have it make sense. So if panspermia siblings showed up before us, you know, the, the, calc the, the statistics say they couldn't have shown up like just a thousand years ago or a million years ago. That would be an amazing coincidence mm -hmm. in their timing. Plausibly, they would have appeared a hundred million years ago or even longer. But And in our galaxy, like a few thousand light years away, a hundred million years ago. A hundred million years is plenty of time for a civilization that allows it to just expand, fill the whole galaxy, fill the neighboring hundred galaxies, <laughs> and make a huge difference such that we wouldn't be here now. That is, they could have come to Earth a long time ago and remade Earth and remade everything nearby into whatever civilization they wanted. Clearly, they didn't do that. So in order to make sense of the story that aliens are here now and they showed up as our siblings 100 million years ago, we have to add a next element to our story, and we're going to have to penalize our hypothesis for this next element, which is they, for some reason, did not want to expand. They did not want to allow this remaking of the galaxy and the universe, they had a rule against that. Now, if we talk to people today, there's a lot of people who think that would be a good idea, so it's not so crazy. A lot of people are kind of wary of us going out in the universe and remaking it. They think that's somewhat of a harm to nature, it's arrogant, etc. And in addition, it would break our civilization permanently into fragments that couldn't be unified together by a single central governance or community. I just want to say real quick too, we're using the speed of light as a travel and communication limit in this theory. Yes. So if you assume that speed of light is not a limit, you have a much bigger puzzle. <laughs> because if you could go faster than speed of light, then any civilization anywhere in the universe could fill the entire universe in space time all the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. So the fact the universe is empty would be a much bigger puzzle. It would say no civilization anywhere in space time wanted to come here and do stuff here. So either you'd have to believe there was only very few of them who decided not to expand or there's none other out there. So uh, I think it's a, it's a much more plausible hypothesis to believe that speed of light is a solid limit, in which case you only have to explain why stuff in our backward light cone isn't here, mm -hmm. not why nothing in the entire universe is here. Yeah. To review, we're trying to make sense of UAPs as aliens. And we're asking, what story can we make up that fits what we see and is the most likely in order to, and then we, at the end of what we ask, how likely is that? <laughs> is that crazy unlikely or just only somewhat unlikely mm -hmm. in the analogy with the murder trial? Okay, so one thing we had to assume, panspermia siblings, like the nearest other aliens are a million light years away, I'm mean, sorry, a million galaxies away, and they are here near us coincidentally because they had the same origin for us, panspermia siblings. The second thing we got to assume is for some reason, they did not want to go out and conquer the universe and fill it up with stuff. They chose to prevent anyone in their civilization from doing that because it would have just taken one deviant to do mm -hmm. it. And they managed to enforce this rule for 100 million years or more. Pretty impressive. 
Does that uh, penalize your model as well? Somewhat. Yeah, you have to say how, how plausible it is. They could have lasted for 100 million years after they chose to make this assumption of uh, no expansion. Uh, and then you have to ask, what's the chance they would have made this rule of no expansion? But once you make those assumptions, now we have an explanation for why they'd be here. We'd say, well, they know that if they're making this rule and some other panspermia sibling shows up and expands, then that defeats the purpose of their rule. Mm -hmm. Somebody else will go fill the universe. And if they don't want that, then they got to come here to do something about it. I know, obviously, one thing they could have come done is just destroy us. They could have just sent a bomb from a distance, and that would be the end of it, and, you know, easy peasy. <laughs> but we'll have to also add the assumption that they didn't want to just destroy us. <laughs> they would rather persuade us. So now we have a story for why they made an exception. Because if they're going to have this rule against no expansion, they can't be allowing very many expeditions away from home. Every expedition risks breaking this rule. And again, they, they managed it for 100 million years. They had to be pretty anal about this. <laughs> Right to manage this. Nobody leaves for 100 million years. Every monitoring station would be an exception, potentially. Right, exactly. And every expedition away would be an exception. So mm -hmm. they can't allow very many exceptions. But they chose to allow an exception for us. And so this, ex this expedition is going to come here, and its purpose mainly, it can do other things as well, is to convince us not to expand. Uh, and without killing us, you know, preferably... And in addition, they don't want the strategy that this expedition has to be require a lot of discretion or judgment or creativity because any one of those things is going to risk this thing going rogue, right? So they, when, when they need to approve a strategy from home. Hmm. Okay, we're going to send this thing out. And it's going to only have the equipment and materials it needs to implement our strategy. And, they, and they're just going to do what we told them to. And they're not going to have a lot of discretion. So they can't have chosen the strategy based on many details about us because they wouldn't know very many details about us and you know our details change over time right? so not just something not just a expedition from that society but a sufficient enough technology or representation of that society perhaps would even break that rule an artificial intelligence that they created perhaps however we define right. it they needed to have strong political officers if you will mm -hmm. <laughs> inside this expedition to make sure it it followed their, their rules mm -hmm. Uh, and so it needs to have a very simple strategy yeah. and just execute it. So then that's our next question. What quarter strategy could they have picked? And we also need to explain one more piece of data to combine these together. So the one other puzzling thing about UAPs is the following. A hundred million year old civilization would be either quite capable of being completely obvious or being completely invisible. Mm -hmm. Both of those would have been easy for them to do. And yet they chose a third option, which is to be at the edge of visibility, not making themselves really clear, and not being completely invisible, which pe many people have noted is kind of a strange thing for them to do. Why hang out at the edge of visibility? So we're trying to explain that. And in addition, we're saying they had to have a strategy <laughs> to come here to persuade us. So we're trying to combine these two things into our story of why aliens would be here if they exist. So um, the answer I can think of to combine these two things together is domestication. <laughs> so great. humans have always had a status hierarchy, and basically most social animals that are relatively smart have a status hierarchy. In a status hierarchy, the higher status animals are respected and deferred to by the lower status animals. And this is, in fact, how humans have usually domesticated other animals and domesticated ourselves. <laughs> Basically, we sit at the top of their status hierarchy. We are the top dog, the top horse, mm -hmm. whatever it is. We show up and we are the top of their hierarchy. We show that we are stronger, more capable, and also somewhat friendly. That is, we aren't enemies trying to destroy them. We're there with them and above them. And we earn their respect. And we've done that when humans, like emperors of empires, this is how emperors have domesticated their empires, right? They have the biggest palace, the biggest crown, the biggest army, and they are the most impressive, the most articulate, the richest. Mm -hmm. And humans have domesticated ourselves and other animals by showing up, being more impressive, being relatively peaceful, and making it somewhat clear what you want. And then people go along with what they want.
that's the history of humans and other animals. <laughs> so the hypothesis is that the aliens, that's also true for their social animals, that's true for them. They have a status hierarchy. They've domesticated other animals by that sort of strategy in the past. And so they figure that could work for us. And it's a simple strategy. You show up, you're nearby, you're peaceful, and you're really impressive. Hmm. And you make it clear what you want. And that's it. Are we clear what they want? Well, I would say we can figure it out. Now, maybe we haven't so far, but it's not that hard. That is, under what I just told you, we know what they want. <laughs> right? <laughs> Theoretically. So all, we have to, all they had to assume is that we could figure this out. We could figure out that they had to be a rare panspermia siblings, that they did not conquer the universe, therefore they did not, they had an argue, a rule against that, and that they made an exception to come here. So, duh. The reason they're here is to get us to go along with their rule. Maybe we, that's what they afford us, the opportunity to see the rationale behind their behavior. Right. So under this theory, all we need to see is that they're here. <laughs> they're not from here. They're peaceful. They're impressive. That's all we need to know. And we should be able to figure out why they're here and what they want. That would be the story. So they don't. So I mean, I think, but why not, you know, be really obvious? Why, why not do that? Obviously, being invisible won't work for this strategy. Why wouldn't be really obvious work? Wouldn't that be much clearer? Why risk any miscommunication? What would you expect from feedback from something like this if you were to, to poke it, essentially? Now, if this thing is there for monitoring right. uh, with limited right. uh, ability to interact, you know, what, what, would, what does that tell you about potential uh, domain of, of responses or behaviors? So even today, a powerful warrior full in full regalia, if punched by a two-year-old toddler, won't retaliate violently because they feel very confident they can't be hurt by the toddler. Their usual norm is to be to laugh it off and to to you know find it funny and engaging that the two-year-old toddler would toddler would even try to hit them, right? <laughs> so we have a general norm that if you're too much more powerful than somebody else, you you take small attacks and you let them slide off, right? And, and so, and that's often a way you show that you're so much more powerful that you, you can't even be bothered to respond to somebody's pitiful attack, right? I, I might not, you know, hit the child back, but <laughs> I definitely would not hit the child back. Let's make that clear. Okay, good. All right. Uh, uh, it's but, very clear. But I might move out of the way. I might respond in some fashion. Right. Um, and so, you know, as we, you know, th th these questions are interesting to me because, um, I'm actively engaged in different efforts to now detect and perhaps consider what the uh, purpose or um, at least pattern of these objects are. Uh, and so one of the things I've considered even professionally when I was working in the defense industry against normal adversaries, but even against these is how do we provide a certain stimulus so we can, you know, build a very simple model, stimulate that model, that environment, and see how it responds to learn more about it. Um, so that's perhaps the, the area I'm talking about now. Have you given that any thought? Okay, so let's get to that after we finish the story. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm jumping because out, that, yeah. that's a, that, I mean, that's a great next point to get to. Uh, so in the story, their strategy is merely to be impressive and visible nearby and um, let us get it and figure it out. But there's this question, why wouldn't they just be completely obvious? Why hang out at the edge of visibility? And the story there could be that even among humans, we often hate other humans for relatively minor differences. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're really quite capable of seeing them as an other instead of us on the basis of pretty small things. These are actual aliens who are actually gonna be different from us in a lot of pretty big ways. Maybe they eat babies, they don't think it's a big deal, but we might, <laughs> they're afraid, right? So this whole strategy won't work if they reveal too much about themselves. Mm -hmm. In the same way that like, elites of an empire might not get the loyalty of the empire if they show too many internal ways that those elites act differently <laughs> from the rest of the people, right? Certainly. So often in the past, elites of an empire would keep themselves apart and just show their impressiveness but not show all their details, right? And so the aliens are just going to be different in more ways, and there's just going to be something about them we hate. Mm -hmm. So they can't risk revealing that much about themselves. But with their strategy, they don't need to, right? All they need to do is be here, be impressive, and make it clear what they want, and that'll be enough. So there, the implication here is all these UAP sightings are just about them showing off their abilities, 
and plausibly there's nothing else they're trying to say. There's no more clues to be gotten. And they actually don't want you to get any more clues. And if you're trying to probe them to get information and they figure that out, they're just going to, you know, re resist your probes <laughs> and not respond in a way that would be informative to you. Just they're just going to, figure, right. Yeah. <laughs> they're just going to try to be opaque. All they're trying to do is make you see they're there and that they're impressive and peaceful. That's it. And clearly, like, they're not trying to help, right? They haven't, they haven't been interfering much, certainly not taking any credit for it to help us. They didn't, like, take one side in World War II or something, or they didn't, like, take out the nuclear bombs in, in, in Cold War, right? There's lots of things they could have done for us. Mm -hmm. They didn't do anything. They're not here to do something for us. Uh, so and not they're not trying worried. to give us information. And so if they don't want us to know, and they're 100 million years more advanced than us, what's the chance we're going to figure out more than they want us to know? Hmm. And so that's just the status quo then that we should expect for the foreseeable future. Right. I mean, we might coordinate more to decide that, okay, I, we really did see stuff and they really are here, but plausibly we won't learn any more about them. I mean, not even their local base. They've got to have some local base, right? physically where they're sitting mm -hmm. and presumably be a little more vulnerable if we knew that where that was. They don't want us to know where that is. We're not going to find out <laughs> where that is, <laughs> if, you know, because they can just hide. Mm -hmm. It's not a pretty picture. It's not an inspiring picture necessarily. Um, so, I, What does it, this say to our, you know, our attempts and our thoughts of better understanding this? Uh, it suggests that the main thing was we should just decide if we already know enough. <laughs> <laughs> and we should draw a conclusion of what we already know. So uh, in a lot of the UAP world, the people who talk about this stuff, there is this norm that we shouldn't talk much about what the evidence implies. We should just be trying harder to collect more evidence to convince people the evidence is really there. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's unfortunate because maybe we already know enough <laughs> to conclude as much as we're ever going to conclude for a while. And we're never necessarily going to get that much stronger evidence because they don't want us to have that much more evidence. So maybe, we, I mean, they want us to have evidence that they exist and they really are there. They don't mind us, you know, being convinced of that. But figuring out what their things are made out of or what kind of physics devices they're using or, you know, how they're internally socially organized, they don't want us to know those things. So... We're presumably, not going to find out. Yeah, presumably our technology will never catch up. Uh, well, not for a long time. Yeah. Well, unless if we assume that there's an endpoint, right? We would. I mean, I, I think it would be fair to say that we can't catch up if they have millions of years on us, assuming we have relatively similar um, right. ability to gain knowledge and progress. Um, and so, in a sense, there almost wouldn't be a way to catch up. There would just be a way to expand our feeble amount of knowledge about it to a, a stair step. I guess what I'm trying to say is we can't just we can't expect to fully understand the situation. So what can we as humans comprehend? What can we say definitively that we know and how do we move to that next thing that we don't know? Well, first we should just walk through more things we know from this fact. Like so one thing we should probably know is they have their expedition here has some limits on its capacity, right? And Why? our and our technology might approach theirs at some point. Mm -hmm. And so at some point they would lose control of us if they allowed us to go past some limit. So there probably is some limit where they would either speak up, take over, or destroy us. We don't know what that limit is. Presumably but we would it's know it'd be expansionary there. in some flavor. Right, right. So one plausible thing is sending a, you know, a probe to another star system. Mm -hmm. That, which if they didn't follow it along and, and keep it under control, would risk you know, them having to spend a lot bigger budget to keep us under control if, if we Presumably they, they wouldn't to, make right? those exceptions, right? Because Right. That's, that would lead to um, just uncontrolled growth. Right. So they have this message, don't expand. But we don't know where the line of expand is. My guess would be it's okay to expand into the solar system, but not beyond the solar system. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, so because one plausible story is where they drew the line was at being able to maintain some internal coherence to their civilization where some sort of community of elites discussed things together and decided things together about what to do. And that's feasible within a solar system, and it's not really very feasible across multiple solar systems mm -hmm. uh, because the time delays just get you know, really huge. So that would be my guess about the line, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how do we move this conversation forward? Um, you've identified that it might be very difficult to further understand this based off of 
really the, the intent of these objects to not let us better understand. I don't think we're going to be satisfied with that answer. So, you know, how can we better understand this? One thing we could do is just get a big enough telescope to go look at all the stellar siblings and maybe identify the ones with life around or maybe even the one with civilization around. Like, they probably have a whole so solar system-wide civilization mm -hmm. around their star, and that's going to have some telltale signs. So we could probably find their home world. Uh, and that would confirm that they're there, right? A stellar sibling home world with a civilization around it. We would go, oh, well, all the more, I guess they're really here, mm. right? It won't reveal much about them other than, say, the scale of their civilization. It won't tell them about their priorities or methods, perhaps, because we, we couldn't see very much. But we could at least see, you know, that there's a civilization there. So this would be a bit of a flipping the script a little bit instead of trying to better understand what they're telling us to look at in a sense yeah um look beyond that to try to get a sense of where they come from just to confirm that they really are there mm -hmm. and they really have you know an advanced civilization how big it is i mean for, for example uh if you just dropped a little bit of nuclear waste into a star we could see that in the stellar spectrum from a long way off mm -hmm. so you know little things like that would probably show us there's a civilization there won't tell us that much about them, but you know, confirms they exist. And then we can look at the others and see that there's only one probably and confirm it's just the one. Do we know if the James Webb Telescope has any of these uh, these candidates, these stellar nursery stars uh, on its list? I don't know. Uh, but again, it's probably only a few of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so the odds of finding the one are probably low, but you know, might as well keep get started. We, we might learn more about them, but it does seem like the biggest thing to learn here is if we learn, that is, can we decide together that we've learned this mm. and to absorb all its implications? That is, it seems to me that this would change civilization substantially if we came to believe that this is the situation we're in. What's stopping us from believing it now? Uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, it's a social science puzzle in some sense why we aren't already persuaded. I think most people out there hearing this will think, well, just the evidence isn't strong enough. You just need more evidence. I got to say, as I've looked <laughs> at the evidence, I, there's an awful lot of cases with an awful lot of evidence. And yeah, I can see how you might want even stronger evidence, but it's not clear we're going to get that much stronger evidence than the sort of evidence we have. Uh, especially since, you know, the evidence we have is often in a military context where, you know, they're shy about revealing it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it seems like it is a sticking point for us. So there's this, uh, some political scientists who have a theory about why we're so reluctant to believe in UFOs, especially why authorities are. And they basically say authorities feel threatened by this hypothesis. Uh, they're, you know, they're supposed to be in charge, and this would say they're not in charge, and we're supposed to sort of have humanity's future in our own hands, and this would say we don't really have our future in our own hands, and that we so dislike this hypothesis that we refuse to consider it. I'm, I'm not crazy, but I'm not sure I'm persuaded. But there's, there's definitely an obstacle here. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't persuade you. How would you add to it or build on it? So I feel like you have a sense of it. Right, so the thing I feel strongest in saying, looking at the evidence, is just that the honest mistake theory doesn't work, okay? So, I mean, we can talk about your story. Like, if I look at your story, I go, some people are trying to say, you made an honest mistake because it was a bird or a balloon or something, and, you know, anybody could make an honest mistake, and that's how it played out. I think that's pretty unlikely in your case, but it's especially unlikely across these hundreds of cases that they're all honest mistakes. That would be quite the statistical <laughs> abnormality. Uh, so then I gotta go with one of the other three theories we're talking about, right? Um, either, and, and that's where I can't be as sure, although honestly, like the hoax theory, the liar theory, isn't crazy. <laughs> that's the next thing I would go to, right, mm -hmm. down the list, and I gotta say, well, what if some big organizations, say the U.S. intelligence or military, wanted to set this up as a hoax, right? And there would be a plausible reason to do so. 
So we were in a Cold War where they had, you know, thousands of missiles trained at us. And if at some point they thought they had the advantage and they could push the button, what we might want to do is just make them hesitate by making them think there's a third party who has opinions <laughs> about the situation. Right? That might make them pause and go, well, okay, we've got the advantage over the Americans, but do we have the advantage over this third party we don't know much about? So it might be worth spending billions of dollars <laughs> to create that sort of uncertainty mm -hmm. on the other part about whether there's a third party who, who might object. Okay, So that would mean they would be willing to spot, spend a lot to do that. So how would they spend that money? Well, they would pay people like you to lie <laughs> or pay someone to fool you with you know, some elaborate thing that they you know, mess with your radar and mess with things they put up in order to fool you. Mm -hmm. And that would be possible. You mm -hmm. can spend enough money to fool people. And they could do that to our allies too, right? Maybe they could pay France and Brazil and Peru or whatever to somebody there to lie and to set up some fakes. And you got to go, well, what's the prior probability on that? <laughs> and you got to go, look, the U.S. military did some pretty amazing fakes during World War II. And there's some other things they've done a pretty good job of faking and hiding. And so you got to go, well, maybe they might do that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that makes me pause there is you go, well, there's all these reports of UAPs within the Soviet Union <laughs> during the height of the Cold War. Like, they had whole projects and they had whole sightings. Like, could the U.S. have really arranged <laughs> for a bunch of Soviet people to lie about seeing these things? and do a bunch of fakes on Soviets. Like, like there was a case where apparently, you know, six jets went off to intercept some UAP and two of them went down. <laughs> Could the US really have arranged something like that? And I go, that's, that's kind of hard to believe, right? Mm -hmm. But that's the kind of thing I'd have to believe, right? Th that's the next thing on the list. If it's, if it's not honest mistakes, there's a hoax and, and a lying campaign, and that would be the most plausible source, and that would be how they do it. And the, the hardest case word for them would be to take the enemy they're trying to fool, get inside their organization enough on a pretty large scale to make a bunch of fake things happening there. Yeah. That's, that just seems a tall order. And these things have been reported all around the world, even China, right? And so that's the thing that makes me go, eh. I mean, in addition, this would have been an unprecedentedly large hoax campaign mm -hmm. over an unprecedentedly large scale. Yeah, and let's not forget you're talking about, you know, Cold War area right now, but then if we look and, you know, update that for modern times and the logic behind that, how would that change your thoughts about well, this being a manipulative scale that's now taken itself all the way into the 2020s? Well, again, the motive would still be there. Just make the other side unsure if there's a third party who might object, right? Mm -hmm. We still have a Cold War. We still are worried about them pushing the button, so they could still want to keep the project going. But, you know, maintaining the ability to, the control behind the scenes, like when their entire government collapses and they re change their government radically, still we would manage to keep yeah. these things going. That would that'd be pretty amazing. Yeah, it's nuanced at this point. So then, you know, you're, you're left with, it sounds like, an unexplainable cohort of observations that... You're left believing these, there's something real mm -hmm. with these really amazing abilities and that either comes from around here or comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And now I got to ask, what's the chance there's some secret organization on Earth, apparently not the U.S. military, <laughs> right, who could have these amazing ability vehicles and then not use it to any military or economic advantage, right? Because mm -hmm. these things are around for half a century at least, and you would think you could do enormous things if you had if you had this technology. Look at all the ways you could use it, and apparently this organization is not using it. Do you think the U.S. would use it? I've so I've stated that perhaps the U.S. would not use it. Uh, because they just would not want to tip off other nations that there was a there there to explore technologically, perhaps. Um, has, has, is that part of the calculus? Well, I they, they I, were exploring other techs. Yeah. So why, why that one? Mm -hmm. Why reserve that one and not all the other ones, right? Because we spent many billions of dollars exploring a lot of techs. Right? If we had just stopped exploring tech, because mm -hmm. we found this one thing, I'd say, oh, we, you know, We've just got to slam. The Maybe we weren't exploring. Right? Maybe we already knew that it was effective. Right, but then why why pay so much for all the other worst techs? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, why not just sit on this one tech you got and not not improve the other ones because you've just got yeah, your exactly. ace in the hole, right? Mm -hmm. You don't you don't need anything new. You, this thing works fine. And I'm just, I'm not trying to play the uh, uh, the counterpoint, but I think about how um, China and Russia, if if that was the case, they would be competing with our what we know is uh, substandard technology, and so we'd be essentially driving a um, a, a useless um, economic drain on their society, thinking that they were 
economically or militarily secure when in fact they weren't. That, I mean, I'm just thinking out yeah. loud here, right? Uh, but what I don't see is an incentive for China or Russia or someone competing with us to withhold that technology. We have the advantage right. and it doesn't make, it would make sense to keep it a secret until absolutely needed. But for other nations, it would make sense for me for them to right. integrate that into their economy. Right, but if if there have been UAP events in Soviet Union, then we apparently have been demonstrating this technology That's to the too. Soviets in the Soviet Union. Yeah. So how is it we're trying to keep it secret? We're apparently trying to let them know it exists. Well, I'm, I'm not <laughs> claiming that all of the sightings are necessarily technology. I'm right. just saying that. But still, yeah. there's been a quite a few mm -hmm. there. So, you know, it's just yeah, yeah. just a thought. Um, okay. Um, but you know, that's the second one you want to go to, right? If, if you don't. Uh, if you don't buy the honest mistake theory, you got to go second to lies and hoaxes. Mm -hmm. um, and then if that doesn't work, you got to go to amazing actual stuff. <laughs> and then the question is, you know, how, how plausible is it there's an earth organization with sort of amazing stuff that they could keep secret this long? And that gets kind of hard to swallow. But then you got the fourth one. Okay, it's aliens. And like, and now you have to ask, but how crazy is that? And you've asked that question. And right. Yeah. And I'm saying, not that crazy. Not as crazy as you might think. <laughs> right. But crazy enough that you've got to look at evidence. Mm -hmm. That's why we're trying to walk through the evidence. But then you're trying to judge these things. So I think, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you, but I think I should always just make clear what I'm an expert on versus mm -hmm. what I'm not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm not an expert on these cases. I mean, there are people who have spent their lifetime studying these cases, and I respect that, and I want to defer to them on these cases. Mm -hmm. That's not my expertise. My expertise is maybe on the sort of where aliens might be in space time and what agendas they might have and then what that implies for society. I'm an economist. Mm -hmm. My specialty is more the social science part of it. So that's why I want to say that's the thing I'm presenting to you as you should believe me more because that's where my expertise is. But, um, but, I, but I don't want to just taboo the other things and say nobody should talk about them. That's the thing I'm complaining about in part is the taboo here on the social science implications. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, you know, where are you in your personal model on your belief of this, you know, of these, of these options? You know, you've, we've basically gone through, I think, all of them, more or less. And, you know, you presented some as lower probability and we're being driven into this other world. So are you now, at, you know, at the point in your personal life that you've accepted this as uh, a high probability event uh, worth exploring further? I'm not going to say well, it's, it's true it's or not. It's high enough to be worth exploring. All right. So that leaves me in a position of saying, okay. What if some UFOs are aliens? I got to go there. Mm -hmm. I got to say, what does that imply about our world? That seems to me the sort of thing I'm compelled to do once it seems serious enough that it's earned the right to be considered, right? The prior is high enough to earn the right to be considered, and the evidence isn't crazy bad, right? I'm not going to give you an exact probability for how believable, but it's high enough that you got to take it seriously, just like the murder trial. Right? Mm -hmm. You got to listen to the trial. Mm -hmm. So, and you got to ask, what would happen if we convicted this guy? <laughs> what would we do with him, right? Before, when you start a murder trial, you have to have that in your mind. The implications if this, of right, the decision. What, what, would, what would we do if we had the answer to that, right? So I got to say, what would we conclude now if we decided some UFOs are aliens? And it's a pretty dramatic change in worldview. Um, so, you know, roughly, we could say the ancients saw themselves as not the biggest creatures around. <laughs> They had gods above them, mm -hmm. even emperors above them. And there was whole realms above them. And they had their place in their realm. And they did not have the future of the universe in their hands. That's not how they saw themselves. They had the future of their city in their hands or their family, uh, their war maybe in their hands. They did not have the future of the universe in their hands. Mm -hmm. That was not something they thought was plausible, right? We, over time, have decided that the gods they saw above them don't exist. <laughs> And we're the top thing around. And our universe looks completely empty. And so we're tempted to say, all this stuff we can see, it's all our inheritance. We eventually, if we so choose, can go out and do whatever we want with all of it. That's who we are. We are the top dog. We are the top of our world. And we have an enormous potential future. And that's pretty exciting. And I've really gotten into that in my life. I'm a bit of a futurist. I've written about future possibilities and think, and that's one of the things that makes it exciting to think about the future. Look at all the places we could go, go and all the things we could do. And it means that we today have this huge responsibility. If choices we make today might influence these future directions, then, then we got to take that seriously, right? And, and I have tried to do that. And I'm around other people who take that seriously. It's very energizing, hmm. right, to think you're the ruler of the universe and responsible for making really big decisions about it, right? And now we learn, well, you thought you were going to be king. You're the king's younger brother. 
<laughs> You're not the king. And you know what? The king thinks that you should live on a little cottage in the back of his estate and stay there and not bother anybody and certainly not get involved in the king's politics. That's who you are. <laughs> you thought you were king. You didn't know you had an older brother. You thought you were going to rule the kingdom, but you're not. <laughs> and now, how do you come to terms with making the best you can about your estate in the back of the king's forest? I mean, it's a better than most people have, honestly, right? <laughs> Being a brother of the king has, a, has some perks as long as you make sure you show fealty to the king. But there's some things you could do that might threaten the king and then he might eliminate you <laughs> or lock you in a dungeon or something, right? That's, that's where we are, right? So now we say, well, we're not the ruler of this universe. There's another power around who, like the king, isn't trying to help us. They're not like buddy-buddy and like, look out for, I look out for you, you look out for me. That's the, not the kind of relationship they've pitched us, <laughs> right? Yeah. Their relation is, we're on top, you're down, you should find this really obvious, you should just submit and do what we say. We are the king, you are the king's brother. And um, that's where we are, right? And now your main relationship with them is just knowing in the background they're not going to help you, but if you cross a line, they're going to squash you. Have that's you, where you are. <laughs> and how, is that, how has that updated your worldview? Or has it? Well, it means you have to sort of pull in the scope of your ambitions in some sense, right? Um, I mean, we still have, a, even under the worst scenario here, we've got a whole solar system we can colonize and <laughs> take advantage of and, and fill and do interesting things with. We have a, a big future, just not as big as you otherwise would. I don't know if it would. Yeah, I agree. It, it limits our possibilities. I don't know if it necessarily has to limit our ambition, perhaps, but... Well, of course, you come to the point, could we defy them, right? That, that may be the first instinct, okay? Could, like the king's brother might think, well, could I sneak off and talk to some other barons and maybe get a resistance going here <laughs> and depose the king and take over, right? And now you're thinking, okay, look, like they're 100 million years more advanced, right? <laughs> or more. <laughs> like what chance do you think you had? Uh, but, okay, there is more of a chance. So there's rot. So in our history, empires, com you know, firms, families, they've often rotted. Mm -hmm. That is, they grew for a while and then they stopped growing and, and declined and collapsed and were replaced by new things. And in fact, this is the history of biology, basically. All organisms rot and die and are replaced by new organisms. Species even rot. We know in software rots, and we have to replace software all the time with new stuff. And so basically either you have a world where things just keep getting replaced with new versions, or if you maintain an old version long enough, it rots. So the question is, if they locked down their border and said nobody could leave, and they had some central governance to maintain that, could they prevent it from rotting? Mm. Could they prevent it from slowly declining over time and becoming less capable? And after 100 million years, how much rot could they have? I guess that would be the second most important problem to solve after ensuring that you don't have accidental expansion. Right. We need to make sure we don't break their rule or do so observed. Well, yeah. if, if the biggest thing is to not expand and, and grow, the next thing is how do you stop yourself from stagnating or destroying yourself without that growth? At least that's right. our question because that's how sure. our natural... Yeah, I was thinking more in terms of, well, how good are they at preventing us from from expanding or watching for us to expand. Well, isn't the assumption that they're 100% good at it? Because they've well, they done it were 100 million years ago, but if they've been rotting since then, how far could their abilities have declined? Have you integrated any type of degradation into your model? Well, you'd have to say, well, you know, these UAPs are showing abilities, and you have to assume, okay, those are live abilities. They have those now. But how much do they understand them? Could they have inherited stuff from long ago they don't understand anymore? Couldn't really modify substantially you know that that would be a, a an extreme rot scenario where they just they have stuff they inherited but they can't really manage it so well anymore sounds like a situation we could find ourselves in well we might become later on if 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 they induce us to have the central thing that lasts and rots then mm -hmm. we would eventually have that problem but at the moment we might think I mean, there's an opening here to slip away mm. if only we can get them to sort of misjudge our abilities 
So the question is like, how, how thoroughly are they monitoring our frontier for anything leaving? Mm -hmm. How thoroughly are they monitoring us from sending anything out? We just have to slip one kilogram <laughs> slowly out of the solar system, off to another star system far away to break their rule. Mm -hmm. It has to be one kilogram containing much more advanced tech than we have now, but that's all it would take. What about ideas? Do you think ideas can be expansionary in this con context? Well, so if we were to beam an AI somewhere, that would... Well, would that would, so that this one kilogram would contain an AI, say. Okay. <laughs> right? Because if you could put a powerful AI in one kilogram and slip it away, dark and unnoticed, and this one kilogram could then land somewhere else in a million years and then start growing and making a new civilization with its memory of us, that would be a way to escape their mm -hmm. rules. And now the question is, could they really have such a thorough monitoring of us that they could see just one kilogram rock, dark rock slip away? Or a transmission? Of some well, you, 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 if you put something somewhere else, then you could make a transmission to it. Mm -hmm. But you, there has to be a receiver at the other end first. That, that's the trick. I'm assuming part. they're more clever than us on that. So, so I, I, you know, then you know, could we develop, say, an AI out of their view <laughs> so they even know we have it? And then we could slip it into this rock and slip it away, right? Mm -hmm. That's it's a really long shot strategy, honestly. But if you're thinking of resisting, that's the sort of thing you have to be thinking <laughs> about. Because remember how 100 million years more advanced. Come on. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about a little maybe simpler type of resistance, which would be uh, attempting to learn anything you could about it. Because any any uh, osmosis of technology or understanding would be that you know a, an attack vector, if you will, or at least a vector to uh, pose a, a threat at some point in the future. Uh, so the simplest would just be acknowledgement, I would think, that sure. this is here. It does seem like if we believed they were here and we coordinated to watch every event, we would presumably collect a lot more information on these events, right? So I, th I think I had a rough estimate of like at least 100,000 UFO reports in the last you know, century or whatever, and maybe even a million that weren't reported. Mm -hmm. So clearly if we were believing these things were real and just setting ourselves up to rec get as much information on them as we could, we would get more. The question is, would it be enough? For what purpose? Mm -hmm. As remember, they're anticipating <laughs> that we're going to try to learn about them and they're trying not to reveal too much. So in this cat and mouse game, do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> <laughs> and so par part of the question would be, how much are they adapting their behavior to their estimates of our abilities? So that's one of the interesting things to ask here. So some people have said, oh, as cell phones have gotten more common, we don't have proportionally more UAP reports, and therefore this is all hoax or, or this is all hallucinations, right? But if they are adapting <laughs> their, how far away they are from us to how far they think we can see, mm -hmm. then they will recede <laughs> as we look more carefully, right? That's, that's an idea that I've heard communicated before. You know, as we get better tools to better understand them, they become less effective um, shortly afterwards, you could say. Right. Um, but, I mean, they, they have apparently, if the UF, UAP reports are to be believed, they have revealed quite a bit about themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and apparently they don't think that's much of a risk. Uh, one, I, guess, I guess one thing we can already notice from what we already know is that they are willing to show us in a wide range of forms, right? If there were just like the one, you know, flying saucer or whatever, yeah. and everything was that one shape, well, you might try to draw more conclusions from that one shape, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a wide range of stuff. And... Do you think it's one actor? Or one group of actors? Well, it would, uh, under this whole story, it would have to be one authority of the expedition, right? Mm -hmm. Who keeps this expedition from going rogue. So however many parts it has, there has to be one part that's limiting it. Do you feel that the observations of many shapes strengthens or weakens your argument or the model? I guess is really what I'm getting at. Well, um, it seems, seems to be a way to hide. Uh, I would think that could if, be part of the edge of perception. Right. Basically, if they just give you a whole bunch of different shapes and context, there's, you can't draw as many conclusions mm -hmm. from it, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you could like find the part of the parameter. Well, they never do these sorts of things. That's got to tell you something, maybe. But mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it looks like they're now. One of the things that happens in this UAP space is people point to then a whole world of what they call the paranormal, and they say, "Well, if you're going to believe this, maybe you got to take all that other stuff seriously." 
And then they say, well, maybe the aliens, if they're doing the UAPs, they're also doing the ghosts and they're also doing the telepathy and you know, all the other things people point to as paranormal phenomena, they wanna tie that in and of course, you know, if you are believing in UAPs but not the other stuff, you're trying to draw a line and resist <laughs> that sort of merging. Yeah. But then there's like the abduction stories and then there's the stories where the UAPs like show up in physical form with a body and you know, that's a hard question here. Like, even if I'm convinced there's something going on here, I'm not necessarily gonna go all the way down the line and embrace all paranormal phenomena as part of the same, same thing. thing, but then I, there is the honest question, well, where are you gonna draw this line? It's a constant line drawing, I found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I don't, I don't think I wanna embrace all paranormal phenomena as aliens in different forms. No. Um, and I gotta say, like, if I go look for the strongest evidence for ghosts or fairies, it's pretty bad, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm willing to think, well, that, that's mostly, you know, illusions and uh, mistakes and, and frauds or whatever. Um, but as you may know, like ball lightning is the sort of thing, if you look for the best evidence in the wild of it, it's, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be convinced ball lightning exists from the best evidence in the wild. The evidence that convinced people is they made it in the lab. Mm -hmm. That was it. So it shows you there can be real stuff, because you confirm it in the lab, that the best evidence in the field is pretty weak. So that makes you not so sure mm -hmm. what to believe in, right? Well, let's, you know, you talked about some other interesting um, characters, fairies, things of that nature. I know you have perhaps considered some mytho uh, mythological creatures or gods, things of that nature, could be tied into the story that may have been around us for a longer period of time. Where are you on that topic about perhaps how we've been, if these, making the right. assumption that these have been around for a while, how right. have we perhaps interfaced with these uh, throughout our, our time on this planet or perhaps interpreted it in our writings or our, our stories? So under the assumption they, you know, started 100 million years ago, the question is how recently did they show up? And you got to figure, well, they probably showed up a while ago. <laughs> Right, they they wouldn't be trying to time it to show up in the just th in the last thousand years before interesting things happen, right? Mm -hmm. That seems a little risky because they're you know thousands of light years away. They they wouldn't want to take that. Especially chance. when you consider how fast technology develops. right right. So presumably they they would be around for at least say ten thousand years. <laughs> so that means there's ten thousand years of history wherein they might have been part of history, right? And then the next question would be. Well, would they change their former style over time to adapt to us, or if they had a constant former style? That, that seems like the, the top question. Mm. So can, first of all, can I reject the constant former style? So if I look at ancient reports that are claimed to be like UAPs, the question is, are those of a noticeably distinct style than recent ones? Mm. I can't see that difference, but I haven't been studying that. But if you could show me that difference, then I might be convinced, well, that's an interesting piece of evidence they have been changing their style. So there's one key question you see that this is relevant for is how much do they know about us, mm -hmm. right? So the more their style has been independent of us <laughs> across space and time, the less we know about how much they know about us, right? Sense, yeah. So if they've been changing their style even in the last 70 years, then that says they have been responding to us and that means they know things about us mm -hmm. and that's information that's valuable, like how much do they know about us? Yep. So like the rot theory suggests maybe they don't know anything about us much. Maybe, maybe the they- The rot theory? The rot. The like rot. Their civilization, maybe their civilization show rot and they, they can't even read our language. They have no idea what we're saying to each other, right? <laughs> they aren't reading our newspapers. They aren't like, they, they're just maybe looking at something like seeing a nuclear explosion and saying, aha, check mark. They're past that point <laughs> in the technology level, right? And just, they have a few check marks like that. And that's mm -hmm. all pretty much all they know about us. That would be at one extreme. Mm -hmm. And that would give us then more options for evading them <laughs> if they hardly know anything about us, right? And under that, under that, we could almost, we could even consider a, an extreme raw scenario where we're just left with artifacts that are proceeding in an autonomous fashion to some degree. Well, the question is how stupid would they get under rot, <laughs> right? And so- Do you think I destruction think is part of rot? Like overall destruction, or does rot end at a functioning yet degraded right. state? So, I mean, there's a sense which we humans, when we're degraded with age, are somewhat more stupid. <laughs> okay, but not, said it, not enormously, <laughs> right? So and even civilizations, as they collapse, the, the elites aren't much more stupid than they were at their peak. Sure. So with those sort of examples, 
I would think, well, if they're more stupid under extreme rod, it's not that much more stupid. But maybe they, 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 but, they but, right, but they have less sort of organizational capacity. They, they couldn't coordinate on bigger scales to do stuff. But the individuals might be, mm -hmm. you know, still, they probably the individuals are still a lot smarter than us. Certainly. I'm, so, I'm just thinking of like, you know, Roman roads being left over. Right. But, uh, the society that built them not being there. Right. But I mean, they, I mean, they're around and they're active. So I would think like this is a basis enough that like if their home world had collapsed and, and destroyed itself, then they could reseed it from this expedition if, if, it, if, the, if that had been allowed in the initial plan. Depending on the time frames with the speed of light and their relative proximity, they would need a certain amount of automation here, especially if the amount of time that we could go from nothing to an advanced society right. is so small, it would have to have it. So I think that unless they had gone out of their way to stop it, they would have just become automation. They, they would just be artificial yeah. creatures. <laughs> so we're, we're going to re remove that distinction a bit, which is fine to do because right. it likely makes well, sense. Well, but it opens a question. Like, there have been these UAA reports of, like, squishy biological creatures. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why? Yeah. Right. So one story would be, well, they're trying to make something we can relate to. <laughs> and they sort of made up some squishy biological creatures to show us in their displays as a way to, like, make us be, make, be, be more relatable, right? Potentially. Maybe. And the other story is part of their whole preventing the expansion into the universe thing was trying to prevent themselves from evolving into being weird. And so they drew a line and said, we're going to save our squishy biological parts and preserve them forever. And that's why we see these, because that was part of their whole, we're going to draw a line on, on progress, basically. Mm -hmm. you know. And there are people today who feel that way about us. Like if you talk about genetic engineering or other things, a lot of people going, no, we shouldn't allow that. We shouldn't allow... Us to, and about artificial intelligence, people say, you know, we should be scared of the AIs replacing us because they're not us, and mm -hmm. we need to make sure the squishy biological things get saved. And so there's a possibility that they saved them, and they really are those there. It's a possibility. I feel like e even if that was what you wanted to do as a society, space travel wouldn't be the particular uh, occupation that you would make that statement. You would yeah, yeah, I mean, probably you would, you know, just send the ship with only machines and you'd grow the new bio creatures at the other end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, well, no, that's still, it's still interesting because if we do make the assumption that there has to be some significant time delay, it has to have its own ability to respond to its environment based off of data that it gets. Again, right? that's, that, that allows us to better define it and isolate it. its, its scope of reactions potentially. Right. So again, we have the presumption the home world didn't want to allow them very much discretion. Mm -hmm. They wanted to give them a very simple strategy to execute that they could trust and not worry about them going rogue and maybe limit their capacities. And so that's that's a key question. They, they might be very limited not because the home world is that decayed, just because they they wanted to limit the possibility of this going rogue. When you think about the game of life, Conway's game, and you know yeah. how such simple instructions can lead to such complex behavior, it's, it's right? a really challenging problem to compress the amount of actions you could place in a society in order to minimize or to steer it in the direction you want. Um, I don't know. You have any thoughts on that? It seems like a well, having the, a small amount of framework seems simple on its face, but can lead to incredible complexity. Sure, but they just want to draw some borders. So they might like they sent out this expedition with some tech, right? And presumably it'd have some self repair tech, right? Things are going to break and they need to be repaired. It'll have some ability to like collect new raw materials to replace old missing materials, say to get to mine something for fuel, right? So it would have to have some of those abilities to repair and make things locally. But you might think, well, they wanted to make sure those abilities couldn't allow it to go rogue, i.e., to send off new interstellar colonies. So maybe it draws a line at like interstellar travel tech. So you think it would it would still be a quite capable? It wouldn't be over optimized for simplicity. It would still have some pretty uh, advanced behaviors from our perspective. Well, as long as they could draw a line to make sure this thing couldn't go rogue, right? That that would be the key. That's thing. That's a big like, question right now, even yeah, with us. Right, but you could imagine sending out a particular, you know, device or set of devices that could repair themselves and make these probes we see, but not make a starship, mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe you could make a device that had that limit. That seems like, if you had millions of years to think about it, you could probably come up with something like that. Do you think that that device would be a, as capable or smart as us? On, yeah, on it could scale? be, I mean, it'd be easy to be as smart as us. That mm -hmm. is, if you limited its physical abilities, <laughs> you don't have to limit its mental abilities. Although, you know, the question is, if you give it any sort of arbitrary manufacturing ability, couldn't it make anything? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so then like, 
couldn't it use whatever machines you you gave it to make an arbitrary manufacturing ability? <laughs> it's a very fine line there, right? Yeah, it's so, tricky. Yeah, interesting. So I would think maybe something like political officers is more the straightforward solution. I mean, so like in the old Soviet Union, like every submarine and other military units would have a political officer whose main job was to make sure these soldiers stayed within the political <laughs> constraints that the military wanted to enforce. Would you think? Would Would you suggest those those Political officers are dealing with more subjective problem sets versus quantitative. Like, so what I'm, yeah. I'm going with this is, you know, you know, why do we have these spongy things in there? Like you said, maybe that, you know, maybe that is a subjective leadership experience that you maybe. know helps maintain that local, <laughs> that right. local less. Um, right. So yeah. let's review. Like, what are the main things we want to know about them? Right. One thing is, could we defy them? <laughs> How weak are they? How thorough are they? Right. What's our best shot of slipping off? Unawares. I mean, they're going to already have thought this through too, right? So this is a pretty hard problem. Like, can we figure out a way we could slip off that they haven't thought? Do of? we really? I mean, not to interrupt you, but is that the, is that what we immediately want to try to do? Or no, it's not obvious we do, thought? but yeah. like that's that's one of the things we might want to know about them. Understood. Do we even have an option here? Mm -hmm. is, this, is this at all plausible? Nice right. To know. Uh, we want to know what their limit is. Like, w what's the line we shouldn't cross? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is there a way to figure that out from their behavior? Uh, and then we want to know, do they have any other agendas for us, right? Like some people in the UAP community or like who have had encounters have had this feelings. They've said that they were, you know, there was a communication of some messages. Mm -hmm. Don't mess with the environment or, you know, don't do nuclear weapons or whatever it is, right? Do they have some other messages or, or agendas? Um, do you vote, view those as lines? Do you think those are potentially examples of lines? Well, um, so at the moment, you and I are in a sort of not entirely loyal to the aliens mode, right? <laughs> okay, but I think a big fraction of humanity over the coming centuries, as they came to accept these UAPs as real, they would go well beyond this mode into more of a supplicant mode. They would accept aliens as like our top status people, even our gods. And they would more want to know what the gods want, not out of figuring out if you can defy them, mm -hmm. but because you want to do what the gods want. Mm -hmm. It's your least I, I, risky option. <laughs> right. So I, I think I mean, it's not just that you honestly respect them. You okay, honestly so look up to them. Okay. You honestly do think they are wise mm -hmm. and that what they think is a good idea is for that reason to you a good idea. So that's strange to us to imagine this, but I think that's the kind of thing you have to get your head around here because that's how most of human history was. Most of human history, we not just feared the gods, we respected the gods and we wanted to be like the gods and to do what the gods wanted. Is there something that we need to change as a society so we don't lose ourselves in that parental relationships perhaps? Well, that's the question. Is that losing ourselves or is that finding ourselves? That is. We yeah. see it as losing ourselves, but they will see it as finding themselves mm -hmm. if that's the way we go. Now, I'm sure our ancestors who looked up to the gods, they didn't think they had lost themselves. Yeah, that's right? very true. They, they thought that was the right way to be. Is this a religious question, do you think, as well as sociological? And how do you really define the two or draw the line between the two, perhaps? In the last year, I did a lot of work on the concept of the sacred, Mm -hmm. And a high-level point to notice is that religion is in decline over the last century or so, but the sacred is not. Mm. So once upon a time, the sacred was all mixed up with religion, but now we treat many things as sacred without really the religious backing or support. It's just treated as sacred. So I would more think the aliens would be treated as sacred, <laughs> uh, pretty obviously, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that counts as religious, I'm not sure it matters so much. Uh, but, you know, so clearly, once upon a time, there were gods who didn't say much. <laughs> and then we had the set of religions where gods had a local messenger on earth who said a lot. Mm -hmm. And then that was very influential in behavior, right? Jesus or Rahabin, people wanted to go along with what they said because that was supposedly God talking. Mm -hmm. Well, I could see this forming, either strengthening or forming new religions, which could be very powerful, frankly, uh, sociologically, but counter perhaps to what the government's goals are because it would be a separate authority figure that is validated right. perhaps if there is right. firm proof. Do you think there's a, a conflict there perhaps? Um, 
I think that one of the clear predictions, if the world comes to believe that many UFOs are aliens, is that there will be this retribution or you know account of, accounting for all the governments who said otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> who kind of had evidence to the contrary, mm-hmm. right? There will be some story about how they were wrong and they should be shamed. And basically, the new governments afterwards will distance themselves from that. Just like we now, say, as democratic governments, distance ourselves from our ancestral monarchy governments and say, that wasn't us. <laughs> that was them. And they did the wrong things and we're doing the right things. Hmm. So then there would be some sort of way in which new governments would say, we're the good governments who who believe in aliens and go along with them, not like those bad old governments who resisted them. There would be a, a you know, a, a distancing from those old governments. Mm. That would be, therefore, a point at which there might be political revolutions even. Like that could be the basis of some way in which there was a great overturning of previous political governance regime mm-hmm. <laughs> using this as the excuse. Those old corrupt governments, they refused to believe. <laughs> they even hid it and they actively prevented everyone from knowing this key thing they, that we should all know, and there would be retribution. Let's talk about the government and its actions today. Maybe you can provide a little um, background on just kind of how you view the events of today with the government's interaction in it, and you know, this has been in the news. There's laws being passed. You know, right. This is now an active topic that's getting a lot of attention. How do you interpret that? My read is that most of the usual elites, say physicists, academics, journalists, they're still pretty anti-UAP. <laughs> and they, it's almost a knee-jerk assumption among them that you would be too. Mm-hmm. So there is allowing you know, some government agencies to issue some reports and issue some things and have some congressional hearings. And that's more sort of allowing this minority to be more prominent than it used to be. But it's still a minority. Mm-hmm. It's still not just a minority, it's a look down on minority, right? Um, so you, you know, might make the analogy to, you know, blacks in the US were raised in status, say, during World War II to have their own military divisions and fighter pilot division or something else. And that was certainly raising their status relative to before, but it wasn't to equality at that yeah. point, right? <laughs> so I would think that's the current situation is the UAP community is being allowed to be seen as higher <laughs> than they once were, but not all, not equal <laughs> to the rest. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so that's fair. That that's certainly true. But do you think that the government's activities outside of boosting up that cohort, that minority, uh, do you, what about their intentions? Because I doubt I doubt that was necessarily their core intention was to prop up that group necessarily. Well, the things I've heard suggest that the primary causal process here was particular politicians pushing them to mm-hmm. basically. Well, they required them to, and then they somehow defied it, and then the politicians went back and like keep kept retrying to require them to, so that they couldn't evade the requirement. Mm-hmm. So you so see, this <laughs> as more grassroots. Well, it's more grassroots through the top politicians. Like, so apparently, several presidents have said, "Hey, I tried to go look into this, mm-hmm. and and I got the runaround." Mm-hmm. And then you know, major heads of the Senate and you know, in Congress, basically said, "We tried again," and you know, and then they just kept trying again and again to force the government to do more. It seems like the government has basically said, you know, they've done what they had to. (laughs) They haven't been like eager Mm -hmm. or, you know, enthusiastic. (laughs) Um, I mean, the question is, how much of a hidden part of the government is there where they they, they know a lot and they're hiding a lot Mm -hmm. as opposed to this is just, you know, decentralized dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, But either either one is plausible. Where do you think this goes in the next two years from the government interaction side? Do you think this fizzles out? Do you think it continues? Yeah, res- Russian to the mean is my usual prediction for everything. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you have a usual history and you have an exception. The exception usually goes away. Like That was the, right after 9-11. That was the question, right? 9-11, people said, is this the beginning of a whole new trend of much bigger terrorist attacks? Or is this just an unusual exception as an unusually big one? And turned out it was the second, <laughs> right? It wasn't a new trend. It was well, for just, some things, but not necessarily that specific right. initial cause. Right, but often when you have an unusual event, that's the key question. Mm-hmm. Is this trend breaking, or is this just an unusually large event in the usual trend? Mm-hmm. And so that, that second theory is the usual theory. <laughs> Usually when there's a, a deviation, it, it's just an unusual deviation, and the usual trend comes back afterwards. Well, we're six years in now. Uh, we seem to still be on an upward slope, I'd say. So, 
Yeah. When does it start forming to a trend in your mind? Well, it's one of those things that you can only look back at and realize it was a trend. <laughs> well, so apparently, like, say, in Britain and in France, they had a process where, like, they revealed all of their records or all the records they supposedly had, right? Mm -hmm. And a, perhaps a couple of other countries did that, too? Condon Report in the UK. Right. And um, the name is slipping my name. I think it was from France. Right. And it's also a C name, I think, or something. Uh, yes. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it starts with a C. But anyway. Taipan. Okay. But, but so those are more dramatic than the U.S. has done in some sense, but they still didn't change the conversation, really. Like, see, those governments could then just say, and we've shut this all down, we're not doing it anymore, mm -hmm. and just have that be their story after that, right? So why isn't that the most odd thing to suspect about the U.S.? So we'll just do that same thing, right? We'll issue, we'll you know, publish a bunch of reports, <laughs> we'll say, see, we're being open about it, mm -hmm. and then go back to what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. Do you want that to happen? Will that will that signify to you that okay, I guess there's nothing here. No, you can go back uh, to your normal work, or I mean, I think that we already have worldwide over the last half century enough evidence that you should like seriously be thinking about what the hell's going on here. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, but and so the question is, what more would it take? Mm -hmm. It seems like the thing it would take is some sort of consensus among intellectual elites. I haven't thought about this much, but it looks like the real limiting factor here is, say, academic elites. Um, I think they are kind of anti, and as long as they stay anti, government wants to sort of seem respected by them. Uh, I don't know. I mean, what what would if many militaries around the government were all to get together and issue a joint <laughs> declaration that, hey, this is real and this isn't from us? Well, that would like, but what's the chance they would do that? I don't know. It's tough to get militaries to admit uncertainty because that is a vulnerability right. uh, and I thought it was a big step when when the United States took that step to say hey we don't know what's over our airspace um, and we're gonna introduce reporting right. to better understand it um, there's perhaps you know I, I can envision a way where uh, this is approached at the the UN uh, and I think there's a pitch that can be made we don't want to have uncertainty in our combat space neither side does because uh, that increases right. the chance uh, for, for problems uh, same thing with aviation safety. We want to be able to address those things. So can we can we admit, perhaps not even just as the United States, but as international community, that there is something that we don't know what it is and look to work together to figure it out? I think that would be a good step. Um, so I have this book, my stuff. second book, called The Elephant in the Brain, Hidden Motives in Everyday Life. And just briefly, it's about all sorts of ways that we are just wrong about big things about our own motives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is... We don't actually go to the doctor to get well. We go to show that we care. We don't actually go to school to learn. We go to show that we're conscientious and conformist and, and intelligent, right? There's a bunch of big things in our world where we, the evidence is pretty clear and we don't admit it. And that goes on for centuries. <laughs> so that doesn't make me terribly optimistic that if you discover a thing that's true, but that the world won't admit it, that you're going to get the world to admit it soon. <laughs> <laughs> you might, but... Some of these things just go on for centuries mm -hmm. and even longer. There's just a lot of things about which sort of official authorities don't want to admit because it's awkward. Have you, have you found a parameter or a trigger that moves it to the other side? So one interesting example is, um, uh, I'm blanking on the word, uh, superstition. Hmm. Okay. So centuries ago, most everyone was superstitious. And most everyone kind of had to go along with accepting the idea that superstition was legitimate, right? There were things to be superstitious of. And somehow over the last few centuries, certainly among elites, that's just become not a thing, right? Elites don't talk that much about superstition. Throwing salt over your shoulder, and you saw those little things, right? Because it's, anyway. it's at odds with the usual elite view of the world mm -hmm. uh, but that took a while it took a long time it was slow and gradual it just it faded away right is that associated with our ability to not control the wider universe it's associated with like science and tech just becoming very high status mm. and in some sense becoming our new religion mm. uh, like used to be the church was the highest authority and in some sense academic science is our highest authority 
Mm -hmm. Even journalists defer to it, governments defers to it. And so it says superstition is stupid. <laughs> and so people are reluctant to seem stupid <laughs> by associating themselves with superstition, right? Mm -hmm. And that superstition has gone along with fairies and ghosts and all those other things and everything else in that category, including UAPs, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the question is, what does it take to get out of that category? So, like, so there's some famous examples, like asteroids, right? Once upon a time, asteroids were in that category. And then some scientists managed to go and find enough evidence to convince others, oh, rocks really do fall from the sky. It wasn't deeply an anti-view, but it was like, that's kind of silly sort of view, mm -hmm. but they were convinced. And as you know, like there's these high pink lightning high up in the atmosphere, right? And the pilots saw this half a century at least ago, and they di didn't say much about it because they were afraid of looking drunk or whatever. <laughs> and then NASA took some pictures of it two decades ago or something and said, look, here they are. <laughs> and the pilot said, yeah, we've been seeing that for a while, but like, we didn't really want to say anything because we didn't want to look stupid. So you know, that that crossed the line, switched over. Ball lightning, and people said, you know, no, that's crazy. And then they made it in the lab. So, so there are these historical examples where it switched over, right? Mm -hmm. Some sort of evidence was enough to make people take it out of the superstition crazy realm and put it into the thing. Now, so what, is, what would it take to do that with UAPs? Like, now, I th unfortunately, like the, ener the problem is that sort of the degree of enthusiasm and energy for UAPs is such as much culturally stronger <laughs> than for these other things ever was. And that makes elites all the more eager to distance themselves from it in order to show their elites. So there's just a lot mm. more energy in among elites to, to show that they are not the sort of people who believe in UAPs <laughs> than there ever was about ball lightning or the, the high level pink spires or, or asteroids. So it's, it's a tougher case. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it still could happen, I guess, but it would, it would take a substantial coordination of, uh, you know, powerful intellect academic intellectual elites to, to make that switch. I mean, so this is related to like, and what's the best strategy to do that? Like, so some people in the UAP community say our best strategy is we're just going to push on some things there. We're not going to talk about what it is, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's their story about how they're going to get the world to take it seriously. I'm not sure that's going to work. <laughs> I have doubts about that. I, I see the spirit of it. They're saying if you just make this claim and not more claims, then you can't object more. Because in some sense, people have objected more to the claim, yeah, there's aliens there, mm -hmm. right? But in some sense, when I reflect on it, I go, well, yeah, that's because it is a plausible <laughs> jump from there. <laughs> Once you say this stuff is real, aliens isn't that far away. Mm -hmm. In some sense, I think people are being honest there to say, well, if you believe this stuff is real, then you do kind of have to be taking the aliens thing seriously. and you're being a little disingenuous by pretending there's no connection. But that's the catch because some people, you just can't engage them on that topic when that is in the realm of possibility. Unless you go straight to that from the cosmology point of view, which is why I'm trying to do is say, you know, basically they're saying this is so crazy unlikely. And if we say why, because cosmologists have told us so. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, they haven't. <laughs> that's where I'm trying to go is say, look, from what we know about cosmology, this is not crazy unlikely. It might be unlikely, but it's not crazy unlikely. That's the key difference. Can we get people to, to accept it's not crazy unlikely? Do you believe we're, maybe it just doesn't fit into your model anymore, but are we on a particular side of the great filter based off of this new model, in your opinion? So I wrote about the great filter in 1998, and it was about a way of reframing the, the Fermi's question, where is everybody? in terms of a, a process that leads from simple dead matter all the way to something that you could see in the visible universe. And the great filter is whatever it is that makes it hard to go all the way from one end to the other of that process. Mm -hmm. We are now not all the way to the end of that process. So we have passed part of the great filter, but not all of it. And so when I first wrote about that 25 years ago, uh, the topic was just how far are we down this filter? And I couldn't really quantify the size of this other than to say the total filter is really large, mm. but we don't know how far down. So my recent Grabby Aliens work can be seen as an attempt to basically make a numerical model of the great filter. Mm -hmm. And in that numerical model, I can say the great filter is so big as to mean it's only passed once every million galaxies. 
and then you know by about now in the history of the universe and then that fills up the universe quickly. So it's a way of making the great filter precise, but it still leaves the question open of how much farther do we have to go, but now it's more precise. So now the way to say is there's a process that leads to a quiet alien, which is what we are, and then there's the last step of the process that leads to a loud alien, which goes mm -hmm. out and becomes visible, which is the stuff we don't see. So the question is how much more is left is the question of the ratio between quiet and loud aliens in the universe. Mm -hmm. So if you do a polls or something, people think the ratio might be 2 to 1, 5 to 1, maybe even 10 to 1, not that much bigger, but you know, often substantially bigger than 1. That is, they think there are more quiets than louds out there. And how, how are we coming to that? I'm just a poll, if I just ask people. Yeah, no, but question. I'm just saying, like, how are they coming to it? So is there any yeah. really way to make that assessment? No, you could just think about what would be the processes by which a quiet might become loud or not. So you could say, what's the chance they would kill themselves, for example, before they got to the point of being loud? Mm -hmm. What's the chance they would choose not to become loud? Uh, by doing the sort of thing we're postulating the UFO aliens are doing of, of not allowing themselves to expand. So, but otherwise, we don't have much evidence. But there's, there's, this ratio affects where is the nearest quiet alien, which affects what are the chances that SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, could see anything. So remember, if the loud ones occur once per million galaxies, <laughs> And then maybe the, if there was a thousand to one ratio, if there was a thousand times as many quiet to loud, that would mean the nearest quiet one <laughs> was still once per thousand galaxies. It means the chance of seeing one is really low in our own galaxy, and you have to look a far away. Mm. And that's only the chance of seeing one and or their ruins. So quiet ones you see would last for some duration and then end. <laughs> in order to see a quiet civilization out there, uh, you'd have a much better chance of seeing its ruins than seeing it because it would have to be active you know, at the moment you're seeing it. And so we do some calculations in our paper to say, unless this ratio is really huge, there's, the chances for SETI are pretty low, at least mm -hmm. given current technology. You're just not gonna see anything because they're not that common. Mm -hmm. But that ratio is the same ratio as our chances <laughs> of becoming loud from now, you know, assuming we're the same as everybody else. And so, that could still be, say, 1,000 to 1, or at least 10 to 1, which means our chances, most likely, we won't make it. Hmm. Uh, but, but we really don't have any sort of basis here. It could be it's only you know, 2 to 1, i.e., you know, half of them do and half of them don't. Hmm. So that's the part that we just don't have any other data to pin it down in our analysis. So we is, just have to say, here's the consequences of different ratios. Is there a thought that perhaps the, gra the expansionary, the grabbiness is inherent to the creature instead of something that has to change over time, it's a natural state of that of that intelligence? I mean, presumably if we had a data set about all the quiet aliens and all the ones that became loud, we would find correlations that predicted mm -hmm. which quiet ones become loud. But we don't know what those are now, so mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to guess. Yeah, just didn't know if that was something you had uh, thought about I mean, about a lot of people all. I'm sure would have opinions on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we could so talk about opinions a little bit if you want to get outside the model, but um, well, so there's, so there's long been this history in, say, cosmology of people talking about how, you know, alien civilizations probably wouldn't be expanding because that would be aggressive and not peaceful. So people have said civilizations reach a point in their lives where if they don't learn to be peaceful, they destroy themselves and disappear from the picture. And so the only things you'll ever see later on would be civilizations that learn to be peaceful and therefore are not grabby mm -hmm. and, and, and do not have war and do not have conflict because they're all peaceful. That seems to be pretty implausible to me. <laughs> it's a nice thought, and it's one right. I've had. But right, so but that would be a, a popular theory for mm -hmm. a long time, right? Which is that it's the peaceful civilizations who manage to survive. A bit anthropomorphic, I think, but right, mm -hmm. it's sort of celebrating the thing about our current civilizations that people are most proud of, perhaps. But I don't think it's that predictive of the mm -hmm. future. When I saw your interviews previous with other people and other pilots things, in my mind, the thing that comes to mind is these skeptics who say, you guys were just seeing birds and balloons and they draw like line diagrams or whatever and they tell you this is the velocity and the distance and therefore this is all consistent with this. And I, and I go, wouldn't pilots like have seen birds and balloons 
before? <laughs> like, wouldn't that be part of their environment? Wouldn't they know kind of how to notice birds and balloons? And But I don't hear you guys saying that. So I, I figure, I mean, it seems to me like you'd be kind of insulted to have to say this. <laughs> I'm a fighter pilot with a $50 million machine. And yeah, I've seen birds and balloons for God's sake, but I know what they look like. <laughs> but like, I think you should say that more directly. I feel like I've said it at some point. I don't know if I've made it in, but um, so let's talk about that. <laughs> um, it's it's a very, very it's fair. So birds, let's talk about birds. They're a real issue. Did you watch the new Top Gun movie? I did, yeah. Uh, so I, I thought they did a really good job of showing how an emergency happens in the jet. So they just got done a very difficult and stressful experience, and all of a sudden, boom, they got hit in the face with a bunch of birds. Um, that's how those things tend believe- to happen. I thought that was a really great example of it. But uh, so birds are a real problem. Um, they can come through the cockpit glass and take the pilot out. Yeah, I've I've seen there's stories of pilots getting knocked out from birds. Makes sense. Um, obviously losing engine wings, all that stuff. Um, when I was a so I was trained by the Navy as an aviation safety officer, which means I spent six weeks uh, in Pensacola, Florida, basically becoming the subject matter expert on preventing accidents, um, training my squadron to the proper standards, but also if there is a crash, to actually be the one responsible for going out there, picking the pieces right. up and figuring out what happened. There's no special team that comes in. But, but the question would be, when you haven't crashed into the birds yet, do you see sometimes them on radar, or on your infrared or other device, or even by eye? Certainly. Would you then know what that looked like yeah. so you know how to tell the difference so, so the point is that this is these are uh, common occurrences and a lot of airports actually have bird radars and so every day yeah. before we go flying we'll brief the bash condition the bird activity right uh and we'll if it's too high we'll cancel the event um we don't necessarily i, I don't want to get too much well i don't want to get too much into this but um they're not something that's presented to our radar uh, just leave it at that. Right. Um, well, but, that would mean these radar sightings wouldn't be birds, yes. right? Uh, <laughs> if, yeah. if there's a radar sighting and the birds don't show up in the radar, then these radar sightings would not be birds. Is that a safe I assumption? Can't, it's a safe <laughs> assumption. I can't say with 100% certainty sure. that nothing on a radar has ever seen a bird. I'm pretty sure you could lock one up if you wanted to, uh, but you're not going to be presented that as like a normal target. Uh, it's just too far right. outside of the spectrum. And section. mylar balloons or something, or other sorts of balloons, right? So then, yeah, then we talk about, so birds are common, but... Um, very easily identifiable. Um, and then balloons, uh, you know, they're not overly common, but they're certainly something we deal with on a regular basis. So there are some right. that are tethered across the U.S. Uh, and we see those regularly. Uh, they kind of look like you'd expect a blimp, you know, yeah. kind of bullet shaped with right. um, some stabilators on the back of and it. So you're used to seeing balloons on your radar, in your infrared, in your other sightings. You know roughly what that looks like, right? Because you see them often. So that whatever other thing you say, and you say, this isn't a balloon, you're doing it on the basis of some background of having seen balloons and saying, this doesn't look like a balloon. Very right? much so. Yeah. And so that would suggest that the theory that this is a balloon has some strong obstacles in accounting for this evidence. It has to explain why it is that even though your experience with balloons, somehow to you, this didn't look like a balloon. Exactly. And do you think they have adequately addressed that issue? Yeah. So I, yes, exactly. That's exactly right. In our experiences, we deal with balloons, we deal with birds, and some of those almost on a daily basis. Um, so we are very familiar with them, and we would not see those as exciting, interesting objects to get you know super hyped and bring the admiral down on, <laughs> to right. show them it. Yeah, and absolutely. So, so what specifically is it about these sightings that makes you say that's not a balloon and that's not a bird? Yeah. So the behaviors we'd expect to see from a balloon are one of three things, essentially. We would expect it to proceed with the wind in some fashion. We'd expect it to remain stationary over a loose area, right? So kind of right. if it was tethered, drifting, it would be yeah. drifting around right. in some radius. Um, or we might even expect, if it was perhaps an adversarial platform, to have some limited capabilities Maneuver. in maneuvering for yeah. short amounts of time. For low velocity. Yes, uh, at low velocity. So. That's all well good, and we see parts of that when we're off the eastern seaboard. But when you zoom out and you look at all the behaviors, you don't see that. You see these objects moving quickly, uh, 250, 350 knots. Uh, you see them at high and low altitudes. You see them uh, performing almost balloon-like behaviors. And what I mean by that is not, not overly linear flight path, but kind of meandering a bit, but against the wind uh, for long periods of time. Um, or being perfectly stationary uh, in those high winds as well. Not just kind of mm-hmm. bobbling around tightly, but stationary fixed uh, at 20,000 feet, say, in 120-knot winds. 
And although those, those might be radar artifacts, sometimes you see them also through other means, which convinces you they're not just radar artifacts. And we were initially seeing them just on our radar, and we thought they were radar uh, uh, artifacts, as you say. Um, but then we were able to correlate that with our other sensor system, our AT FLIR, uh, which is an electro-optical IR, infrared energy uh, detection device. Um, and so, okay, hey, the radar is dropping our camera sensor off, essentially, right. at this piece of sky, and now there's something right. there on our camera. So. Uh, the assumption is at this point that they're physical objects. Um, and just to be clear, the things that were moving at 200, 300 knots are also the things, the same thing that you saw. Correct. On, it's not like a separate correct. thing, right? That would be the key point. Correct. Like this couldn't be a balloon because that same thing on the radar was moving at 300 knots a few minutes ago. Correct. Um, and so, yes, they would sometimes be stationary, you know, perfectly stationary and then begin moving at those high speeds. Um, and it would, it would do these for long periods of time. So we'd go out there first thing in the morning, these objects would be out there. Yeah. And as you said earlier, I, I, can, I can conceive of trickery, you know? Right. Uh, I can conceive of perhaps, you know, submarines or some devices that were releasing objects over a period of time that had, you know, high energy density, but also, you know, then just went to the ocean or something, right? But um, it would be, you know, we've been seeing it for so long and the behaviors that were exhibited just pushes that, you know. Right. Could you, could you get, make a rough estimate of the budget that we required to fool you guys over this period of time with this scope of activity? Like, how big a project would that have to be? Oh, it would be incredible. It, it would be equivalent, I think, to uh, essentially the operations we did in the Cold War where there's stories of, you know, arming nuclear weapons and making sure that they, you know, they're on a timer for a period of time. It would be an ongoing, you know, multi-billion dollar operation for decades at this point. Um, you would need you know, the equivalent of probably half of a carrier strike group, but underwater or somehow unable to be seen. You'd need thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of small form factor UAVs uh, that would be launched and then disposed of. And somehow we didn't right. see that intermediary Sorry, action. So, so like a carrier group is some, yeah. uh, what, like 5% of the Navy budget or something? That, that's uh, I, don't, I don't know that. Well, we could look yeah. it up, whatever it is. Like we're talking that level of budget. Yeah, that's what you would send to a, a war zone. I mean, that's, right. that's what we go to right. war with. So you would need, so they have to be spending that much to fool you guys. Yeah, you would need, you know, manned crews, all that. And right. so it would be vastly expensive, it'd be a huge drain of resources. So then you get to the point of why. Why right. are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we doing it in international waters where anyone can go underwater and, or under right. the space and just observe our frequencies they, and our tactics? Why don't we use our Would somebody see all those areas? submarines if they were there or something? Um, right. You would think so, so right? So, but, so I think if somebody was trying to make this story happen, it would be just cheaper to make you guys lie, right? It's just, it's just incredibly <laughs> complicated, yeah. Wouldn't and that I, be, that I would look, be the cheap, I mean, how, how yeah. much can it cost to get 100 sailors to lie? Yeah. I mean, especially you tell them this is your job. This is, you know, NASA security. You, have you must, you must lie, right? Yeah. So it, it would be incredibly difficult. And then there's the why and then the period of time and then all the other lying that would have to go around to support it in a very public fashion that for me, the right. thought that it is our government doing this is pretty close to zero for me at this point. Or at least the part of the government you know of or just any part of the government? I would say the part of government that I know of and that I know that I don't know about. Right. I don't yeah. know the unknowns, but I know there's a black world that right. a lot of stuff. I've had security clearance. Those and about they, 20 they years wouldn't old. be up to this or they, they just wouldn't. You wouldn't this. Th this is not consistent with the behaviors that they do. I mean, I've worked in the defense industry. Right. I've tested stuff. I have right. some of these fields. And that's just one set of sightings, right? So there's like thousands of these sightings, each one of which might require that level of, of budget mm -hmm. to make to fake it. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, the occurrences that are happening off the eastern seaboard are still happening. I'm still talking to pilots who are still yeah. seeing cubes and spheres. Um, but to go back uh, a moment, you were saying how we weren't seeing 100% of them with our eyes, which is true. I had a hard time seeing them. Uh, we would come up to them in very controlled fashion. We would expect to see them. Our sensors are showing it, uh, but we can't see them. And we turn around, they're there again. Uh, but eventually, we did actually gain sight of them. It was a particular case because the object was located. If this, this table is the working area, so yeah. from a God's eye view, like right here at the entrance, edge you know what I mean? Right? At the right altitude. So it okay. was at the spot. So they know where your edge is. Yes. Um, and it was stationary, and I, I keep saying I need to do research on this, but I don't think their radar was working that day. I think that's why they almost hit the object there, because... Oh, the two ones who went zoom past the... Yes, so they the were border, going right? out yeah. in a section like this, and right. these objects went right between... It was stationary, they went between it, but that's how I describe it, the relative motion. So uh, these times when you got close but you couldn't see it, is it believable that it's because they were so small or is it plausible that they were really like, they could choose to be opaque if they want, they could choose for you not to see them if they wanted? I don't think it's a size issue. 
Okay. Based off of the Then maybe radar. they can just change the appearance of their surface to look like the sky or something. Maybe I think they... there's, you know, there's the possibility of the quote unquote cloaking, right? It's doing something to its surface to make it hard to see. Yeah. A, that, I mean, that's one. The other right. one, of course, is that they don't all correlate to physical objects. And the IR energy that we're seeing on our FLIR, for whatever reason, doesn't correlate to something I would be able to see with my eyes, a physical object. So I have a physics background, and one of the things physicists I know speculate about is this idea that you could send a beam to a point that induces a plasma, and then you could like draw yep. whatever thing you want with a plasma beam, right? Now, that wouldn't have been something we could have done in 1940, but maybe that's something we could have done in the last 20 years. Is that, I mean, that might be a cheaper budget, maybe, if there's like some projector somewhere mm -hmm. that's sending this beam and they can control, maybe they send two beams and where they intersect produces a phenomena or something, but then you could just draw this thing mm -hmm. in space and make whatever pattern you want. And it could accelerate and disappear, et cetera. There's no so, physical object there, but that's why it looks like it's accelerating. Right, right, so, so it's like drawing up, you know, a hologram in space, basically. Mm -hmm. So. Is that the sort of thing that could have explained the kind of thing you see? Could could such I mean that such it could reflect late radar, I guess, if there's a plasma there. It could show an infrared because it'd be a hot plasma. Mm -hmm. And you could just turn it on and off. I well, I guess you couldn't turn it off that fast. That is you can't send a cold beam to, to freeze it. You could turn off the hot beam and then it would slowly cool. Well here's here's so I've looked into this. Um, I've talked to some people uh, within the government and this was an area of research that the government you, I've heard have pursued and say, hey, is this possible? So one one thing I was interested to learn was that plasma can actually return radar or return make radar returns. Yeah, like cause, so you could it's, yeah you could place this out there and actually free have electrons radar. in it basically yeah. that would reflect the radar. Yeah, um, well, I didn't know that, but I just knew it would reflect it. But. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but either way, so um, so uh, yeah, it, it seems feasible that you could do that. I've looked into it. what turns me off for that being a real thing are are two things: one, the energy requirements to do so, and two, the fidelity uh, of the projection uh, potentially. So. The fact that we saw these with the own eyeballs and the fidelity was described right. for me negates that possibility. So is this about like an angular accuracy of the beam? I mean, couldn't they have just a really narrow beam that it would just be a very precise spot where the plasma was happening? Or are you thinking like the beam would have to spread out? I think there would need to be multiple beams that are high precision in order to provide the, the, the square and the circular shape with the fidelity that existed. That's okay, so, so it's, it's the spatial precision then. So I could I could suggest... But you didn't see a square in a circle, right? You just saw, saw, you so just saw we, a spot, right? Yes, but I didn't see it, but there were, everyone in the squad were seeing the same item. So although I was one okay, that so did so lots it, of people saw the square in the circle, not correct. just these two guys who had correct. the thing in between, correct. right? So so for me, that's that's the fact. And that's still being seen today. I've talked okay. to tens of pilots. The, the cube in the sphere, sphere. Yeah. sorry. The cube in the sphere, is that that's it? Cube in the sphere, yes. Right, okay. So, so when I think about... Um, just the radar and just the AT FLIR, the technology that you described use plasma, I think is conceivable, potentially. Okay. But when we add the visual sighting to that, that's where there's a So this is about me. just the spatial resolution. How fine a beam could you send? I mean, you'd have to do a raster thing. You basically, you know, raster, just sure. like you do with these, a TV screen or something. These objects were five to 15 feet in diameter. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it would have to raster. Um, it would have to be extremely high precision. It would have to. So it's those parameters that seem unrealistic to the people you've talked to. That you could make a fuzzy blob <laughs> move around, but you couldn't make something with that precision of a shape of a of a cube inside a sphere, mm -hmm. a transparent sphere. Right? Now, I want to be. I, mean, clear. I don't know how to make a transparent sphere with the plasma. That sounds tricky to me. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> how do you make something that looks like glass with plasma? Mm -hmm. well, that's, and that's know. a tricky one too, because the the pilot witness he specifically stated that it was it was clear. I added translucent or translucent because I have, right, to you have to see the thing inside. exactly <laughs> right um, you're seeing the clear sphere so it can't be perfectly right uh, clear exactly um, so I, yeah and you know these are the details that then start making that that theory more murky for me and then then when you add on top of the the why question right right why would we be doing this for eight years and then but of course this also won't explain stuff from say before 1990 or something sure. none of those they could have the pla they wouldn't have had the plasma mm -hmm. raster technology this is just, we're all, just, right? just to be clear audience, we're just talking about at least for me right now the east yeah. coast experiences essentially right. yeah that wouldn't work there and so that i mean a lot of us have to look at you and go well, what's mm -hmm. the chance he's in on this and lying right yeah. i mean it must feel weird to like to know people are looking at you going what's the chance he's lying yeah i i, I feel like most people I don't know. I just assume people don't think I'm lying. I don't know. I just, right. 
I don't because I'm okay, not. But, I'm but not if we don't think you're lying, then we got to. We have to draw these other data. conclusions, right? We yeah. have to. We have to, these really big dramatic conclusions. Like either you're lying, or these like our worldview has to change. Like so, which do we want to do? I'm lying, and also I'm being supported by huge infrastructure. With a huge infrastructure, yes, because my story. You know, I I made my statements, and I didn't expect this to happen. But then people FOIA documents, and things yeah. came out, and it, you know my story was validated. So you'd have to assume that there was a wider apparatus than just me. But that would be the story here, right? There's this, I mean, how much would they be willing to spend, basically? Yeah. Could they make a whole carrier group that does this? Like, I mean, well, if they made we're still talking about us, right? Would another nation do this to us? Or could we slip this carrier group into the Soviet <laughs> Baltic Sea or something yeah. to, like, trick them or something? I mean, you know, why are we tricking our own pilots for almost a decade now? And trying to trick the Soviet pilots and whatever. I mean, again, there is this plausible thing, like, just make the other side uncertain if there's a third party, right? That, that's worth a fair bit. But the th but could you really pull that off inside their organizations? Mm -hmm. Like, could you make Soviet pilots see this stuff? I would assume we'd have to be working towards the same goal to make that happen. I mean, so this is why this is a hard subject, right? I mean, so I feel this emotional sense of, just run away from this. Like, there's, nothing, there's not much to win here, right? You're not gonna look good. Nobody's gonna thank you for this. Like, just go do something else. Run, and I gotta bet a lot of other people feel that about this, right? Mm -hmm. Just run away. Find an excuse and run away. Because, you know, sure, the world needs to know, but you don't have to be the one to tell the world. <laughs> Let them figure it out risk. some other way, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, do you feel that, I mean, so a bunch of your other pilots, they didn't go public, right? They could have, you did. Do you feel like you're different from them because like you felt more of an obligation to do it or? I think there's a few considerations there. One um, was that, well, one, yeah, I did. I did feel an obligation to do it when I first started speaking out because I knew, like, to your point, I was going to be first, more or less, and the risk was going to be on me. But, you know, as I said earlier, the Navy trained you to be an aviation safety officer. And in 2017, right. I saw the New York— But all these other officers, they aren't doing this. I know. <laughs> but I was also, you know— You just take this mission more seriously than they do. Well, you know, sense. the guys that saw the gimbal video and stuff, I mean, yeah. these, are, these, are, these are my best buddies. I mean— right. The guy that we hear in there, he was at my wedding party. We've known each other for about a decade. So, you know, for me, it was insulting and, and it just pissed me off that this was an issue now that was in the front of the New York Times. And yet I then just called my friends on these coasts who said, yo, of course, yeah, we're flying by these. Like no one's doing anything. We're almost hitting these things. And I know the lessons in the Navy that we fix things after someone dies and we write our books in blood. And right. this was an opportunity I felt that something could be done before we had a catastrophic issue. And it wasn't necessarily the, yeah, jet's gonna hit it because that could happen, but that's just a risk we take as aviators. It was a strategic and, and tactical risk that we were potentially exposing ourselves to through an adversary if they were the ones taking advantage of our inability to look at something strange. So I, I cited the, a study of the following in my first book, Age of M. Uh, it's a study of employees and what makes them happy. and. One set of employees has a concept that their job is like a certain specification of a thing to be done in the world. And other people have their concept of their job as pleasing their boss. Mm -hmm. The second group of people tends to be happier in their jobs <laughs> <laughs> because they do whatever it takes to please their boss and then they keep their job and they don't have as much tension. The first group of people, if the concept they have of their job is doing a certain thing like making the sky safe, well, they have a problem because often their boss disagrees with them about how to implement that job or even whether that job should be done, right? Mm -hmm. So you sound like more that first kind of person. <laughs> you took the safety course and you think of my job is to keep this guy safe as opposed to my job is to please my boss. Mm -hmm. Like, because otherwise you go to your boss and say, what do you want to hear? Certainly wasn't pleased my boss with this, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but that tends to make people unhappy, right? Mm -hmm. But in some sense, the world world runs on those first people, right? In some sense, like a bunch of things don't go wrong because some people take their job so seriously that they're willing to cause conflict with their boss in order to do their job as they see the job defined. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that, that was what the Navy taught me and that's what they instilled in me. And do your job even if your boss doesn't like it. Well, no, it's that, you know, we have a, a higher calling in a sense and that the people that you're out there serving with are why you're there. And so for me, when I saw the New York Times article and I reached out to my friends and realized it was still happening, it was, man, we're setting ourselves up for failure and this was just right. another opportunity. I think this is a thing most people don't understand about the military, which is maybe why I'm pushing you to say it, <laughs> which is many people have a sense in the military that if there's any place in the world where you do what your boss says, it's in the military, right? 
command, respect for command, just do what you're told is seen to be a central part of the military, mm -hmm. right? And so, and maybe that's true for many militaries in the world, but there are some militaries, maybe ours, where there's a big part of the people who say, no, my job isn't just to do what my boss says. <laughs> my job is to do this particular thing I was taught to do. Mm -hmm. And if my boss is giving me resistance on that, I'm going to give some resistance back because my job isn't defined by what my boss tells me to do. My job is defined by this other thing. Mm -hmm. And that's an amazing fact about the military because <laughs> you might think in any job it's a bit of a problem to resist your boss because he's just got a lot more lovers than you. And so is it really true that in the U.S. military at least or what militaries in the world is it true such that they have this concept of their job, which is hey, I was taught how to do this thing. This is the thing I'm supposed to be trying to do, and this is the thing I'm going to do even if my boss pushes back. I think for fighter pilots, we have a higher calling uh, to some degree where our safety of our mission and of the assets and of each other are the highest um, high of consideration we have. And as a lieutenant in the Navy, if my commanding officer in 05 or in 06 is demonstrating unsafe practices in that fighter jet, I have an obligation to remedy right. that situation, even if he's my commanding officer. And we're taught as aviators that the responsibility and the decision-making authority of the pilot in that jet is at the end of the day, absolute. And we have the authority to um, go against our, our regulations and rules to ensure the safety of that aircraft. In a sense, this was the same principle. So I'm wondering if that's an unusual feature of pilots because they're so high status. <laughs> like, is this really true of an ordinary group of soldiers on a front line that they have that same sense of, we do what is good for our troop, even if, you know, it's, and the boss says otherwise. I mean, is because like pilots are so respected that, you know, successful pilots go on to become admirals, <laughs> right? And successful pilots go on to become senators. And right, like we, like pilots are at the top of our military respect in terms of outside mm -hmm. sense of like, those are the top people. Anyway, maybe that's you know, why we have that agency to perhaps push a little bit. Right, more. so maybe that you're an exception. <laughs> oh, I, I, right? I would think to so. To other parts of the military where it's more do what your boss says. I agree, yes. I'm, I'm certainly stating that that cohort is is the exception in that area. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, yeah, whether I was, um, you know, rebelling perhaps against that authority or not, I, I felt an obligation to right. do what, what I thought was right. But this is also a reason why we should pay more attention to pilot testimony than anybody else's testimony in some sense, because you do have this norm of this is our job and we're gonna do it. <laughs> and so we can more trust you if you tell us this is in the way of your job, then there's really a thing there. I'm not gonna suggest why people should or shouldn't trust pilots. You know, I think, you know, that I think- But I will. Yeah, okay, you can. <laughs> I, I feel it's kind of productive myself, but- um, Cause I'm yeah. not a pilot, I don't know any pilot. <laughs> I have no stake in pilot world, right? yeah. I have no, connection to pilots whatsoever than talking to you today. This is my only <laughs> cons connection to pilots as far as I know. Um, well, you know, regard, well, I don't want to say that. I've been looking to harness that reputation to expand the conversation through this podcast and others to provide a platform for pilots that haven't felt comfortable about this to get on this in the seat on the stage and right. be a voice for this, just like in the past with the ball lightning oh, we didn't want to talk about that. They didn't want to talk about that because of how it was received, right? Right. And so I want to provide them a platform where they can communicate clearly and openly about their experiences so we can move the conversation forward in a way we haven't before. And I think, I mean, a key status contest is going on here between the status of a pilot, which is pretty high in the military, one of the highest, and the status of, say, academic physicists who say, yeah, but balloons and and birds because here's the vector calculation I give you, right? Yeah. Because they're also pretty high status in our yeah. world. And that's sort of a status fight that's happening here, right? And so, you know, the, the essence of that is they have to argue that you guys would mistake a balloon or a bird for the stuff you're seeing, that that's a plausible theory of you. Consistently. Right, consistently over years, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the other... The only other option is to say this thing they've been dissing for decades, then they stake their whole reputation of their discipline on is, is wrong. They, they, they made a wrong bet. Mm -hmm. They said that's so stupid that we can just ridicule it and sort of have fun with that. Mm -hmm. And they, they decided to ridicule a thing that turned out to be real. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> that's going to hurt them, right? That's yeah. going to hurt their status in the world. Like mm -hmm. the, all these physicists who are so arrogant about this, if the world comes to believe that this was real, 
they're going to be knocked down a peg, right? But they'll and, also be exposed to an incredible opportunity. I would think. Maybe not them personally, well, but the career itself. Well, there's this all this physics to learn, but by, in a party who's not – and try not to show you. Well, physics, <laughs> physics aside, but yeah. I mean, they're just if we're, we have identified an, an unexplored area. I mean, it's I think a golden opportunity for us to redevelop our ideas and our considerations around what we can learn and what might be relatively low hanging fruit if we actually apply ourselves at scale. So, I used to be in physics and computer science, and then I've been in social science, political science, and economics. And a basic issue in academia is. Why is there so much less agreement about social science and the human sciences than there are about the physical sciences? And in my mind, you know, basically, even though we've known less about the physical world than the social world for a long time, we've made more progress in the physical world and we come to stronger conclusions we can make more devices in the physical world than in the social world. So something's different there. Mm -hmm. And my best explanation is, well, we, we care about the social world. We have opinions about the social world, so we are more you know, that's more of an obstacle to just figuring out what's true if we, there's a bunch of things we want to believe. Nobody really cares about the physical world, honestly, emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> so they're willing to believe all sorts of strange things because, hey, if that's where the evidence goes, that's where it goes, right? But in now, see, this is the physical world getting more into the social world. <laughs> Once physicists speak up about things that people have opinions about, say global warming or nuclear you know, a weapons risk or things like that, they've had a lot less success mm -hmm. at using their authority to get people to believe what they say because now they're in this world where people care about the opinions. Mm -hmm. And that would be true here for UAPs, right? They would now face, they can't just you know use their usual way of the world is just random with respect to their experiments. Now this world is not random. This world is you know, being adversarial, <laughs> trying to make it hard for them, right? They might, this world, I mean, basically if these people say, say they saw us sending like various, you know, probes at them, like a neutrino wave or we something. We were sending Yeah, probes. say we, we yeah. were trying to probe the UAP to, for, to detect it. them, right? Well, they would probably see these things and they would think, okay, how do we change our things to, to fool them if, if we want to, right? Mm -hmm. This would be an adversarial relationship. Mm -hmm. We would be trying to figure out what the stuff is made out of and they would be trying to hide that. And who wins? There's a, there's a, it's very similar in a sense to dogfighting. <clears throat> in a dogfight, you want to try to force your opponent to make decisions sloppily quickly right? and you know? I, ideally there's going to be a reaction period so even if you're and if you're defensive if the person's behind you you can still move your jet you're still going to be able to make the first move so if you make the first move if you see them first <laughs> oh yeah i'm talking yeah so i'm getting you're right i'm talking they see you first after. they make the first move. so let's right? say you're right here right yeah. you're the guy in the back yeah. I go like this. This guy has to react. There's a reaction time. In a sense, it almost right? sounds like there's a technology reaction time here. Because if we could quantify that time period, that tells us something, right? It's just a, I'm identifying places where there's potential for additional data generation, and that potentially is one. So when the Catholic Church was king of the world, right, um, it had important theological claims, and there wasn't that much support for people trying to challenge the church or question its claims, right? Mm -hmm. So if the world comes to accept UAPs as really existing and really being at the top of a social hierarchy and really being the sort of people, you know, the things we should emulate and follow, I think there might not be that much support for attempts to challenge them or probe their claims or whatever you know, so that, of, that's the, the, of the group, that's... Right, yeah. So the question is, like, how acceptable is it to, like, test the gods? <laughs> <laughs> to probe the gods, to mm -hmm. look for their weaknesses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is, that, is that a popular thing? <laughs> Probably not amongst the gods. <laughs> but among the supporters of the gods, yeah. the people who, who worship the okay, gods. Okay, so you're right? seeing <laughs> there could be that interpersonal conflict based off supporters. Well, like, this is, like... If we, if our world now sees humans as top and when we're in charge and we should question everything. But if we go back to more of an ancient world situation where there's the gods above us and they rule over us and we are below them and we are trying to align ourselves with them to, and to support them, how much support will there be for efforts that could be seen as somewhat hostile or questioning? Hmm. There might be a limited period of in this early years where that becomes possible before it doesn't. Mm. That, that's a, that shows you the size of the change you might be looking at here. Yeah. 
right? It's it's intimidating to think about the societal changes that could happen because it's it's almost as scary as a realization in itself. And right. I would say even probably more so, more challenging to have an open conversation, especially around people that don't want to engage in this topic. I mean, it all makes, so say there really was a like secret military organization behind the scenes that had all this evidence and they asked themselves, should we tell the world or should we keep this a secret? I could almost see them bringing up this argument. Well, you know what? When people don't believe in this, they're more ambitious and they go farther and they and they challenge things. But once everybody believes that these alien gods are really around, they're gonna they're gonna back off on that. Mm-hmm. Like one thing we know about the aliens is they're much more stable than us, right? They are not eagerly growing and changing mm-hmm. <laughs> over long periods of time, right? They're they've been around for a hundred million years, and they are restrained with respect to their impact on nature, right? That's another thing we know about them. They, they did not go wild colonizing the universe. They're kind of eco-freaks, really. <laughs> and that would raise the status in our world of also more restrained impact on neighbor, less importance of growth and change, and even less, in, less of a sense of we're importance and we're at the top of things, more of an acceptance of, of, a, of an order of the universe. Mm-hmm. These would all be predictable consequences, right, of coming to accept this. Hmm. And you can almost imagine those people going, not yet. <laughs> Let's hold off on that. <laughs> Can't imagine that, yeah. And I can al- I can see the argument now. I can even think, well, should I be talking about this now? <laughs> Maybe I'm making a mistake. I, this is actually a thing I've thought about many of the topics. I've, you know, I just eagerly, I go, I find something neglected and I go, oh, all right, important thing neglected. I'm going to jump in and like figure this out. And then you have to answer the question. Now you're responsible for telling the world about this thing. And sure, it's good to have an overall presumption that more knowledge is good, but it's not always going to be true. Some areas more knowledge might be bad and might be one of your areas, especially uh, since other people chose not to do this. Maybe you're defying their judgment here. (laughs) Maybe it's not so good if we all know about this. I got to admit, that could be true. I think whether that's true or not, or at least I feel like whether that's true or not, Objectively, subjectively, as humans, we're going to want to know regardless. Except there's all sorts of stuff we don't look at. That's, so that's the subject of my second book in the Alright. There's a whole bunch of stuff humanity has known for a long time that we refuse to look at, that we consistently look away from. That's fair. And that says maybe there's a lot of things we don't want to know. Speaking maybe more about myself <laughs> than humanity in general. I mean, I, I yeah. would need to know. But you're right. I mean, there are a lot of things that we just simply close our eyes to. I mean violence and there's plenty of horror in the world just yeah. to make an obvious example i know sure. your book has many others but yeah it's it's definitely on the table so i mean i have to some of us are just sort of knee jerkers we got to know right mm-hmm. and the world maybe doesn't always win when we people got to know figure it out but hopefully on average it does but I'm, i just can't be very sure in this case it's so great that we're all going to find out we're the king's brother, not the king. <laughs> and we got to have limited ambitions here uh, if we don't want to get squashed. It's not a, not a pleasant story. <laughs> <laughs> I had something. Every time you, you, you say the limit are, are um, not the potential, but ambitions. Are, ambition, are... I always like, I want to I wanna attack that somehow. But, you know, the only attack I can think of is one of, of scale, you know, and, and a reassessment that perhaps the ambitions that are, are so far that are so big that we would be limited from are still such, so f- they pale in our understanding of what that could be, right? Um, here's an example, right? So we, you know, we're, all, we're talking about expansion into space time as if that's the only potential way that we could grow as a society. Right. Um, what about the thought of, you know, expanding intellectually through virtual reality and, and things of that nature? Uh, or artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. say. So, the question they have to have asked is if there's some kinds of progress we could do on our computers down here they can't see very easily, could that threaten to greatly increase our ability to violate their expansion rule? Is there a connection there? Because they, then they'd have to be afraid, right? If all, Say we could have AIs that would figure out how to make a cheap starship that's small and, and, and dark. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we make it and slip it away and they never see anything because it was all on AI simulations they, they could never see, right? Now they gotta worry. Once they see us having a bunch of computers doing stuff they can't see, well, you know, maybe then we could do this thing to slip away and they gotta draw the line there, mm-hmm. right? But if they're not drawing the line there, they have to be pretty confident. You know what, I'll do as much stuff as you want on the computers. We don't care. We know that that doesn't help you make a starship until you actually start to make a starship. Mm-hmm. 
and that would be an interesting thing they know about us, right? <laughs> that there's only so far AI can take us just doing stuff on the computers. We'll have to build real stuff and they could watch for that. <clears throat> wonder if you could use that as a litmus test for the scope <clears throat> of potential technology. Right, so we'd be trying to develop the kinds of tech that they can't see so that we could jump ahead farther than they see, right? If we're trying to fool them <laughs> into finding a way to slip away. How would we do that? Would we do that by, you know, look over here but not over there? Or well, the is there a way to really do that reliably? I mean, one thing is with AI, we should have, and what I call brain emulation, which is the subject of my first book, we should eventually be able to make computers that have human level intelligence is in them, mm -hmm. that if you sent off a starship with just those computers, then that would have us basically and, and do stuff. So then they have to know that as soon as we have that ability, we can send a much smaller starship that works, <laughs> right? It doesn't have to have a whole human and all their biological stuff. It, it can just have a computer on it. So that means they have to be looking for smaller starships as they're, when they're watching out for them. But I guess they they either have to be watching carefully to see when we cross that boundary mm -hmm. of being able to make those things, or they'd have to realize that they can already detect even smaller starships, so they're not very worried. But yeah. I mean, honestly, like a starship would initially just be a rock that drifted away, and it can drift away pretty slowly for for ten thousand years before it like speeds up and <laughs> slips away, right? So could they really see every kilogram size rock in the solar system that could escape the solar system? I mean, that seems like a crazy enormous monitoring especially if you magnify or uh, multiply that by all the potential civilizations they could be monitoring right but ju just the ability to do the the uaps around us here is much less than this, that this ability to watch every rock that could slip away mm -hmm. that would seem to be an enormous capacity they have to fill so you'd think you know they maybe they draw the line before that <laughs> it's just one of those capabilities that would I, in my mind lower the probability of it being successful so if you are taking such a a, a you know, one-off chance like, hey, we have to stop every possible rock that gets out of here. You know, again, if you multiply that across yeah. all the potential civilizations, your probability of success, I think, would be well, pretty remember small. Well, remember, the most and the most probable scenario here, there's just us. There's no other civilizations. <laughs> there's just this one yeah, other if civilization. Talking, yeah, most probably. Our, yeah. our panspermia siblings, mm -hmm. and then there's just us, and that's it. <laughs> so we're the only one risking breaking the rule. So they can devote a pretty large resources to us. But the question is, like, why should they wait till we're much bigger where it's more expensive, why not cut us off earlier if they're gonna cut us off? So, I mean, they must be hoping, you see, that we decide to, to become this civilization-wide, peaceful eco-civilization that doesn't want to expand. And that'll happen soon, and then they, can, they don't have to shut us down because we will do what they want without us having them having to push for it, right? So that seems to me like they must have a belief about when that typically happens in a civilization's evolution, mm -hmm. when it happened to them, say, and they're they're wanting to wait until that either happens or it doesn't. After that point, if it doesn't happen, then they got to step in and do something. But they want to give us the chance to do it first, and and actually at the moment, that's just, we are at that tipping point. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's important to notice, say a century ago, most nations, the elites of that nation were mainly identifying with that nation, and they were thinking, how can we promote our nation? And today, elites in the world are mainly identifying with the other elites of their type in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why there's so much convergent regulation around the world in nuclear energy and medical ethics and all sorts of things, which is why, and it's part of how our civilization is no longer competing fiercely internally. Uh, we don't have as much national competition. And we are halfway there to this world where we all decide things together and we like that and maybe we don't want to end that by allowing interstellar colonization. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be the story. Like a few centuries from now, we'll say this long history of we solved global warming, we solved inequality, we solved overfishing. Look at all these things we did by getting together and talking about it together and having our elites agree and, and just do it everywhere in the world. And then at that moment, the chance of sending off an interstellar colony will mean that ends forever. Mm -hmm. And the question is, will we allow that to be sent off? Or will we try to impose a regime forever more of not allowing that, which is very expensive and hard, but that would be the cost of having this integrated world community. And I think a lot of people really like that. That is, we aren't fighting each other and competing and, and then evolving into strangeness. We are gonna stay human, we're gonna stay a community, and we'll, when, when we have a big issue, we'll all talk together, we'll decide together, and then we'll do that thing, and that will be humanity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I think that's just a very attractive vision. And a bit Star Trek for Star Wars, if you will. Yes, right. Star Trek is more the world community agreed together and 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 enforced its agreements. 
Where do you think we're heading? Well, you can just see a lot of emotional energy in that direction. You know, that is because we're halfway there. Like think of COVID. In COVID, within a month or two, the usual medical ath- experts' advice was thrown out. Elites around the whole world had a whole new opinion about masks and travel restrictions, and the whole world did it together. <laughs> without and basically nobody even did a you know a challenge trial, mm-hmm. which would be violating the usual medical ethics rules, and nobody in the world allowed 100 people to just get infected and see what happened. That shows you how much we're already sort of halfway to world government. Mm. And, and people like that. So at the moment, Iran is the only country in the world that allows organ sales of any sort, and it's gov- very much government managed, but medical ethics conferences all the time, they're talking about how they're gonna make Iran stop being this deviation who's doing it different. Because the whole idea is any one country deviates from the world consensus, and that's just a crisis that needs to be addressed. It's like in COVID, the biggest deviant was maybe Sweden. And they were really dumped on by the rest of the world, and it turns out they did pretty well. And that's not talked about so much <laughs> because people really hated the idea that anybody would deviate from the consensus on what to do. And that's where we are now. And you can see that sort of an attitude once you reach, if, say, several centuries of more of that, and we succeed in many ways of solving many problems that way, and then the question is, should we allow a colony to leave, after which point the, our civilization is fragmented, it fights, and it evolves into strangeness? Do we want to allow that? And you can imagine them saying no. Mm-hmm. But the consequence of that is you don't expand. <laughs> And then you never become the big grabby civilization that goes off to you know fill a million galaxies with whatever you want, but you stay a unified civilization, and that's plausibly what say the UFO aliens chose. That would be the theory why they're here now, but the universe around us is empty. That's fascinating. Well, thank you for fighting the consensus with me on this. Ah, <sighs> well, I feel like I may have opinions, but the most important thing about this is just to get the basic conversation going and getting people to see the choices. You know, I don't think my opinion should influence where civilization goes, but I want us to see our choices. Exactly. We can't be blind to this, and that's what we've been. So, you know, by having this podcast, bringing folks on like yourself that are willing to go out there and have those conversations and think about it logically, I think for me, that's one of the avenues I've chosen to help move this conversation forward. So thank you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure.